Isabel Brown, <laughs> Hello. lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for having me, Matt. I'm so excited. It's great to have you. I'm trying to figure out how we both, well, I wouldn't know this, how you heard about me, but how I heard about you. So how did you hear about Pints with Aquinas? Right? I heard about you through the farmers, through George Farmer oh. and his episode on your show. And ah. then I binge watched as much Pints with Aquinas really? as I possibly could. Mm. I love your show. I send it to everybody I oh, know discerning you. Catholicism. And it's just such a great mix of what's going on in the world culturally, yeah. but also bringing people to the church. It's like a gateway drug into Catholicism. Yeah, it's perfect. A lot of really good guests. <laughs> they come through here. And Except they... just don't say no doesn't apply here. You want to say yes to watching this show. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I heard about you. I think I think I first heard about you on Instagram. Obviously, that's where you're mainly at. Yeah. Eh? How, like what? How did that take off? Because you have a lot of. I do. I have a lot going on. I wear a lot of hats, as I like to say. Um, mainly my job every day is to be a full-time independent content creator, kind of like you. So what that means for those who don't know what on earth those words put together actually mean, I say a lot of things on the internet for a living, and I try <laughs> to just tell the truth every single day in whatever way I can. That might look like a 15-second video on Instagram or on TikTok, or I host a daily live stream for a few hours every afternoon talking about all of the crazy things going on in culture, in our faith, in dating, and politics and everything in between. Where do you do that daily live stream? From the spare bedroom of my apartment. No, but, but I meant on Instagram. Uh, yes, on... no, it's on all long form video platforms, YouTube, Rumble, okay. Facebook, locals everywhere. It is a blast and we have a lot of fun. Do you know, it's funny how things become things. I, uh, mm, that's a great sentence. Like before, <laughs> I remember I started speaking at churches and conferences before people started referring to themselves as Catholic speakers. Mm, I don't know mm -hmm. if they do that anymore. And content creators, I, maybe I missed that, but I started this podcast back in 2016. I suppose people, maybe it's a generational thing, we're calling themselves content creators, whereas today it feels like more and more people are just identifying with that. Yeah, I think the word used to be influencer, to be honest Ooh. with you, and it got such a weird negative yeah. connotation. I've always hated that word Why? as a side note. I don't think you can call yourself an influencer. Other people can say <laughs> you influenced them, yeah. but you don't know the impact that you're making on someone's life. So I think it kind of naturally shifted into content creator. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because you're right, generationally, that is a career now. People are making careers out of this in everything. I see doctors and veterinarians and business owners also on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube or with their own podcast. And I always like to tell young people when I'm speaking on high school or college campuses, no matter what you do for your life, you probably also should be looking into content creation because it's a great way to get truth out there in a world that really needs it. So how did you start doing content creation? I never dreamed that I would be doing any of this. I was actually pre-med in college. Mm -hmm. I have long loved the truth. And I say this a lot in my book, in different speeches that I've given uh, ever since I was a little kid. And I haven't grown much since then. It's hard to tell when you're sitting in a chair, but stopped growing in the sixth grade. Uh, so my height won't speak for it. But ever since I was a little kid, I've loved asking the big questions about how the universe works and how mm. we know something is real versus how we've proven it to be false. I grew up going to science summer camp. So maybe that had something to do with it, but have always, always loved the world of science because it was about the pursuit of objective truth. And I wanted to create a career for myself when you start getting asked, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Where I could couple that with also helping people. So medicine was kind of the natural uh, response to that and the natural next step in my journey. I pursued my degree in biomedical sciences at Colorado State University, the state that I grew up in, and later got my master's degree on the policy side of that in Georgetown in Washington, D.C., but uh, loved the idea of taking anatomy and working with cadavers and figuring out how our bodies work. Oh my gosh. Got to do that you for gotta, a few you gotta, semesters. You need to pause here and tell me what it's like to work on a, cada a cadaver for the first time. You know, the very first day is interesting because like five or six kids will always faint on the first day. Right. It's a natural thing because you're just not used to working with so the how do, human how do they body. Prep you and what's it like walking into that room and do they unveil the cadaver? Yeah, they do. So the way that anatomy class worked on our campus, I love that this is I the love, side this note is the good topic. Thing about I love long this. Form discussion. Yep. I didn't know we were going to talk about this, but let's do the it. The way that they prep it, in, at least in my program, most undergrad students never get to take anatomy with cadavers. They might take things with animals or they might go to a singular cadaver lab for a few hours, but we did this for an entire semester. And then there are TAs that have already taken the class that are dissecting the cadavers because you don't think about this. Oh my gosh. They are real people, right? But you see like a leg or certain muscles or whatever by the time it gets to your class. So somebody else has to actually do the dissecting. Uh, but on the first day, they make you sit down while they wheel everything thing in just to make sure nobody will pass out. Uh, and you start with different areas of the body. So we started with lower limb and then we worked to the thorax, abdomen and pelvis. Then we did head and neck and we ended with the upper limb. What it was, was awesome. What was the grossest thing? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I mean, it is like all around kind of gross, but when you're in the world of science and medicine, yeah. it doesn't really bother you that much. 
we got to compare a lot of livers of people who were alcoholics versus really healthy, or we looked at a lot of diseased kidneys. Hernia repairs were super interesting. These are usually elderly people that have donated their body for, for research and for now, science. Now, are you looking at these parts independent of the body? or within? No, it's like all in the body, or you could take them out and work on them independently. Wow. Then I got to also take a neuroanatomy class, which was also fascinating, getting to hold so many brains in your hands and figure out how all of that works. We have very cool bodies, Matt, but it was such an eye-opening experience for me because the more I pursued science- <laughs> No, I'm sorry, I'm not done with the cadaver thing. <laughs> so- uh, <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll come back, we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back. When did it become like, okay, this is normal? Cutting into honestly, like end of the first week. Really, but I, I wasn't actually doing any of the cutting. The other class, the dissection class that were RTAs, okay. was doing all of the cutting. We were just there to identify everything and learn where everything was, where it attached, how it operated, all of that stuff. Cool. Okay. You yeah, can, you it was can great. Move on now. As I was saying, though, I think it's really cool because the more I was diving into this, or even outside of the lab in science classes, the more I learned about how an individual cell worked, or how a single-celled organism is different from a multi-celled organism. The more God made sense to me, and I'd always been raised in the Catholic Church. I've always been very passionate about my faith, but a lot of people will lead you to believe that science and faith are mutually exclusive. I was finding the exact opposite. The more answers I was getting, the more questions that I had, because how is it possible that this tiny, tiny organelle in your cell, we like to joke the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell in my generation. It's the only thing we remember from science class. How does a mitochondria work to make sure that we work at the trillionth level every single day? That has to be from something larger than ourselves. That can't just be random. But I was in these classes like organic chemistry, which is terrible. If you ever have to take that class and you're listening to this, I will be praying a rosary for you. Uh, physiology, cellular chemistry, just like everything was so fascinating to me. But then we would learn all of these things. And at the end of each unit, my professors would tell me something that was so off base, so far beyond objective reality or truth or let alone science mm -hmm. that I would just find myself floored sitting back in my chair Give thinking, us some examples. what? Physiology, for example, we spent three, four months learning about every tiny step that has to happen for a baby to develop in the womb to a full term pregnancy. When different organs start forming, wow. when children can feel pain, when your brain is active, can babies dream in the womb? Yes. And during this point, did you feel like this is rather a pro-life presentation? Absolutely. How I mean, how could you look at this and not realize this is a child? Like we're looking at these images, we're looking at 3D ultrasounds, we're asking all these questions from the objective truth pursuit perspective that science is supposed to encompass. And then after three, four months, our professors would say, but abortion is vital, life-saving, reproductive health care. Women will literally die if we don't take this away. So you're probably all going to be forced to participate in this. Get ready when no you're doctors. Way. And everybody just nodded and ferociously wrote everything down because we were so operational at that point. This is the path to medical school. This right. is the fact I need to know for the MCAT to get into medical school. I'm just going to take it all in, write it all down, and I'll absorb it later. But I just felt myself in so many instances sitting there thinking, how is this possible? How are these brilliant people that I know and that I'm learning from who are very well esteemed scientists telling me something that is so far beyond the truth and everyone's just writing it down in their black and white ink and just accepting that to be true. So it really got me asking all of these questions about culture at large and how academia is not really a hub of the pursuit of objective truth anymore. Did you feel the freedom to raise your hand and ask questions during those classes? Absolutely. Or? It's probably not a surprise. I've never really been one to just sit down and shut up so, about So what did you ask and things. how did that go? I, I was hesitant to at first because nobody else was. And I kept waiting and waiting and waiting right. on my huge public college campus, federally funded institution, large agricultural school. It's a huge ag program at Colorado State. So you'd mm -hmm. expect a lot of pretty conservative people and yet nobody was saying anything. And I waited and I waited and I waited and I just kept thinking, I cannot be the only person that has the values that I do. I'm at school with 33,000 other people. Statistically, somebody out <laughs> there probably has to agree with my worldview or share any of my values. And I decided to do something about it by running for student government to represent my college at our larger student government. Uh, if you don't know much about the way student government is structured on public college campuses, it's usually called something 
something like the Associated Students of your university. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was called at our school. It's typically a massive hotbed of extreme indoctrination and very, very secular leftism. So I was very much a fish out of water uh, and very quickly found myself labeled as the public enemy number one on my campus. That sounds so hyperbolic, but it's not. Yeah. Um, death threats, people threatening what? to rape me, people what? doxed my address to my one bedroom apartment online. Okay, what, what did you do to bring that about? I was advocating for freedom of speech on my campus. Quite literally, this was just the first step in the journey that I decided to take. I wanted to have more ideological diversity on my campus. That was it. And that's all I was advocating for in student government. And were you asking questions about abortion and pushing back on that? Was that part Not of it? quite at that point. Mostly I was looking to host other speakers on my campus. Bernie okay. Sanders, for example, had been invited and paid for by the tuition that I was paying and the student yeah. fees that I was paying to speak on my campus twice. Yeah. And Angela Davis, very very renowned communist figure uh, and voice for the Communist Party in America had come to my campus a few weeks earlier. And I was thinking, you know, this is a little backwards. You can't have just one side of the argument presented here. So I was really just going into saying we should encourage people to challenge their perspectives. That's what college is supposed to be about. Mm. And I was labeled a fascist, a Nazi, a Hitler youth Barbie. I get that one a lot, apparently, because I wanted people to be able to experience other points of view and other perspectives. When you say you got a death threat. What, what, what did that look like? Death threats started really coming about after I randomly got an ad on my Facebook page for this organization called Turning Point USA, which I had never heard of before. Um, that's Charlie Kirk's company that's doing activism work from the conservative perspective on college campuses. <laughs> and I saw an ad for an event they were putting on called the Young Women's Leadership Summit. And I had no idea what this company was doing, what this event was, but I recognized a few names on the poster. Ben Shapiro had been pretty viral on my YouTube at that point. Point. And I didn't know much about him, but his name and his picture were there. Tommy Laren, I kind of recognized that name because somebody had compared me to her in my class a few weeks earlier. And I just had this deep seated feeling. I didn't know why I had to jump on a plane to go to this event where I knew nobody and I knew nothing about the organization. Uh, so I, I went, I jumped on a plane, went to Dallas, Texas in June of 2017, right after my mm. sophomore year and totally fell in love with this idea of there were thousands of other young women exactly like me all over the country who felt like they were the only person in their college or high school community with their values. When you say your values, what values did you share? Uh, really, this was at the time mostly politically, but also religiously as well. The idea that there could be something greater than our universe, that God could exist and our rights come from God, not from the government. Okay. Uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression, wanting to challenge your perspectives, not needing handouts because you were a woman, but be having the freedom and the capacity to work your way to success and build your own American dream mm. yourself. You weren't an oppressed category. You just got to be the victor of your own life if that's what you so chose. So I wanted to bring that back with me and I ended up starting a Turning Point USA chapter on my college campus, which is kind of like a club where you hang out and you meet people. Uh, but a big part of what they do is bring speakers to campus like a Charlie Kirk or a Dennis Prager or Candace Owens or Ben Shapiro, any of the ones that you always see going viral on <coughs> college campuses. And that's really when the death threats started in student government for me because I was doing both at the same time. So people I was sitting next to in our Senate meetings every week or people that I worked with on campus started saying that I was a Nazi and that all Nazis deserve to be effing shot. People found the... Would they say this to your face or were they in write texts, it? Mostly, In texts mostly, yeah, or Facebook okay. messages. Uh, most of the time, because they were messages, the good news is that's not freedom of speech. Spoiler, when you threaten to shoot someone in the head. So we were able to develop a really great camaraderie with the local police department on mm -hmm. our campus. And they were very supportive of all the work that I was doing and watched out for me. Um, but it was a scary time. I, I mean, it's say, hard. You seem rather sanguine about all of this. Now At the time, I it am. must have been... You know, even then, people ask me, like, how are you dealing with this the way that you are? You should be totally freaking out. It was definitely scary, especially when my address was doxxed. I mean, I lived in a one-bedroom apartment right off campus. Um, I had really bad roommate experiences and said, to, to hell with this. I'm not okay. doing this anymore. This is horrible. Um, so I ended up living alone junior and senior year. And when my address got posted, I was walking home from the library at like 3, 4 in the morning sometimes after marathon study sessions for organic chemistry. Again, God bless you if you're taking that class. I got a 50 54% in that class, and it was a B with the curve. So that should tell oh, you wow. everything you need to know. Um, but my parents in particular were really a lot more scared than I was. So, um, okay. So the, the death threats came that way. Um, you're walking home at three in the morning. So... Yeah. Okay. Keep going. I'm sorry. I, I was about to. I was. I was. I, I was about to respond to something, but I forgot. So. 
Um, you know, I honestly can't tell you though, Matt, how I wasn't more afraid. I was uneasy for sure. How did, it was scary. How, that's what I was going to ask you. How did your address get doxxed? Uh, I have no idea. Somebody online, posted it. You... A person I didn't know posted it on the comments section of a newspaper article on Facebook that they had interviewed me about bringing a speaker to campus. At the time, it was Charlie Kirk. I ended up hosting Candace Owens and Dennis Prager on my okay. campus as well. Actually, it was Candace's first ever college event was at my mm. university while I was there. So we go way back because of that. And it's very fun. But um, somebody that I didn't know had found my address somewhere i don't know maybe through hacking the student system or something like that and posted it online and that was when i kind of realized there are huge consequences in our cancel culture world for mm. advocating for freedom of expression who knew that that would be the most controversial thing you could say on a public college campus that you should learn from people who might be different from you that's what academia used to be all about mm -hmm. my parents totally freaked out uh my mom actually insisted on coming to class with me for like five days before leading up to the day i hosted charlie kirk as a speaker and it was so embarrassing having to drag my mom to pharmacology class my mom doesn't know anything about this my parents are both attorneys and she loved it she felt like she was going back to school but the police couldn't come with me to class they had a job to do and we didn't know who was getting all this information or sharing all of it out there. There's no logical explanation for why I was able to keep a pretty cool head during that time. But I, I do like to think that was very much the Holy Spirit protecting me from a lot of that stuff. And this became a very spiritual warfare thing very quickly for so many people. You said you've always had a fondness for your faith and it doesn't sound like you ever kind of broke away from it. Not at that time. No. Um, interestingly, toward the end of my college experience and in the first few years of my 20s and my postgrad years, I was really out of nowhere interested in exploring other denominations of Christianity. I had a bit of a falling out with some of my friends in the Catholic community on my college campus because I was so hyper invested in the movement on campus. And there was some weird leftist things going on in our in our local Mm -hmm. perish there on my campus. So thought, okay, maybe this is a good time to just explore things. I've always been Catholic. I've always taught this is the only way to do things, but I'll, I'll take a few years and just figure it out. Um, so was a little bit homeless there for a while without, without a denomination. But like many, many Catholics that do that, I immediately came home to the church as soon as my faith was reignited about a year and a half ago. A year after go from today. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. How has your opinion of free speech changed, if at all? Because it seems to me that it's always the, the group who feels themselves oppressed, whose ideas are not accepted in widespread culture, that are calling for free speech. So perhaps back in the 60s huh. and 70s, it may have been those we might consider left who are decrying the fact that they couldn't say certain things. Absolutely. Now the conservatives feel that way, so they're decrying it. But I don't know. Like I don't think that the rainbow flag has any place in civilized society. I haven't thought through what that means politically, and I'm certainly not advocating for the ban of it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, it seems to me that over the last 10 years or so, I, I haven't been so excited about free speech. Yeah. And I, I'm, I have, I'm just trying to think that through. Do you that's a fantastic question, and I love your analysis there about the the more marginalized community feeling the need to defend freedom of speech more than ever before. I think you're right. The roles have reversed quite substantially uh, between when my parents were my age on college campuses and, and when I was on campus there from 2019 to, or sorry, 2015 to 2019. It's something interesting to explore because everybody has a different opinion about it. I personally have come to the conclusion that the answer is always more speech. When someone feels marginalized, the answer is always yeah. more speech. When somebody is trying to silence the marginalized, yes. the answer is always more speech. I'm a big believer in dragging really bad ideas, evil ideas, hateful okay. ideas out from the darkness into the light and defeating them with better ideas, right? I think there's something so beautiful about that. I did competitive speech and debate in high school, so maybe that's where that's coming from. But I like that because it's I mean, it's in saying that you're not denying that hate speech exists. No, it absolutely because exists. People were hateful towards you and they spoke probably to you and said hateful things. And then you go, OK, well, it would be nice to live in a world where this didn't happen. But then you go, OK, well, tell me what that looks like exactly. Yeah. How do we do that? And I think as soon as you start to ask that question, you realize that the quote unquote solution is going to end up being more problematic. Always. Than yeah. Allowing it. Yeah. I think more speech often just allows us the opportunity to humanize each other a little bit, too. OK, so maybe what I'm saying then isn't against free speech. It's just maybe this overemphasis that I see among conservatives about, oh, all ideas, all ideas, as opposed to going, no, that, that's actually degenerate. This is disgusting. This shouldn't be promoted. That kind of stuff. Yeah, which would be the more speech side of that, right? Defeating the bad ideas with good ideas. Those ideas uh, still exist, and they should, in my opinion, have the legal right to exist. I, I also feel like as, as the conservative movement, whatever that means, you can tell me what that means in a moment, mm -hmm. has sort of bl 
blossomed, exploded. It feels like Daily Wire was one of the big kind of leaders in this regard. As that tent has grown, because it feels like people who feel they're under attack tend to band together. Mm -hmm. But as that movement has grown, it feels like now we're seeing a lot more infighting as to what it means that what what conservatism means. Yeah, you know, I don't actually think there is a definition for that. My fiance and I were just talking about that with regard to the upcoming presidential election. Mm. I don't think if you asked any of the people who do what I do or what I have done over the last several years in the conservative pundit world, what it means to be a conservative, I don't think you would get the same answer anytime it's you been, ask it's somebody. It's been a negative definition, I think, over the last 10 years or so. It's, a defensive it's, definition. Not that. Yeah, exactly. We're not left. And I think we're having a hard time transitioning mm. to the offensive side of things politically and secularly in America. America, which is why I think you're seeing so much infighting. But to speed up the whole story, basically found myself in the trenches on my college campuses. Lots and lots and lots of insane things happening to me in undergrad in particular. Grad school is much better, much more tolerant, ironically, um, and was really just ignited with this passion to not just expose people to different perspectives, but to bring back my pursuit of objective truth. That's what academia was supposed to be about. So amazingly, even with all of the hatred and the craziness and all of the stuff going around uh, beyond the conversations that I was was having in this like weird hurricane happening on my campus of craziness, people would come find me on my campus when I was walking to class or when I was sitting in the student center eating lunch and say, hi, you don't know me, but thank you for what you're doing. And I really appreciate it. I thought I was mm. the only one that had my values. Professors were coming out of the woodwork to say, you don't take my class. You're not in my department, but I can't say anything or I'll be fired. Thank you for what you are doing on our public college campus to stand for freedom of expression and mm. actual academia. And I realized that God was really throwing my life in this totally different direction than working in a fluorescently lit hospital for the rest of my life. And I sat down with my parents uh, at the end of my junior year and said, hey, I don't think I want to go to medical school anymore. I just don't think that's where I'm being called to be. And they said, OK, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to go to law school? My parents are lawyers. So they would love if I had done that. And I actually was accepted to law school and decided not to go. Totally different side quest. Um, but I said, no, I, I think I want to be posting stuff on the Internet, like in encouraging people to do what I'm doing on campus larger in the broader generational sense of what's happening in our country. And my mom started laughing and my dad said, well, if you can figure out a way to pay for it, sweetie, we're all supportive for making that happen. Who so were you seeing at the time that you thought, oh, I see the impact they're having and I think I could do Candace some, Owens was a yeah. huge inspiration for me. She had started a really tiny YouTube channel at the time called Red Pill Black. People probably don't even remember that about her story at this point. That had maybe five or six videos on it that went super viral. Didn't she do this little skit where she came out as a conservative? Yes, parents? yes. That was such a viral video. And oh I gosh. loved watching that. I remember when she posted that. Um, obviously, what Ben Shapiro and Charlie Kirk were doing at the time mm. with some of their videos on social media so or there podcasts. So there would be an example about how I see fracturing taking place within the conservative movement. You correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't know Charlie Kirk that well, but wasn't he responsible for bringing a porn performer to a conservative conference? Well, so Char that, that conference that you're talking about in particular is called America Fest. It started mm. just a few years ago. Um, it's sort of the annual big event for Turning Point USA. I'll be there in a couple weeks, actually, nice. in, in Phoenix. Um, he doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the day-to-day -day operations of the company. He I started see. the company. He's still the CEO of the company. But it but was their company that... He really this. operates in a different world. There was a huge swath of influencers. And honestly, I wasn't involved in any of this. So I'm just giving you anecdotal yeah. information here. But to my understanding, there was a huge swath of influencers that were invited. That person ended right. up being one of the influencers so that, that were seem invited. that condemning loudly. I, I was pretty outspoken about okay. this shouldn't be something that we're yeah. doing, but it is also intended to be the top of the funnel opportunity to bring people who might not adhere to the conservative movement, so to speak, mm. or even be aware to come and learn. And so I, I actually think it's beautiful that we're inviting anybody and everybody to come and learn and sit there and engage so in when conversation. You bring a, when you bring a digital prostitute on, you're tacitly, it seems to me, giving a wink and a nod to what she's doing. If they're a representative of your company, yeah, absolutely. But if you're coming to an open conference that anybody and everybody is but invited to. you're giving them to, a platform, right? No, not necessarily. She didn't have so a these, platform? So these conferences have like five, 6,000 attendees, sometimes more. Oh, so she didn't and people speak? Come, no, she, there was no oh, speak. Okay. She just came to attend, to oh, my knowledge. Oh, okay. I don't, again, I don't know too much about the situation. Sure. Um, in particular, I remember hearing a lot of stuff about it and thinking, eh, that's a little weird. Maybe we shouldn't mm. be doing that. But the more I learned about it, it was just somebody who came to learn. So the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know, it's pretty 
pretty great to be able to invite as many people as you know. As I'm going to use possible. a really manly analogy here. I love it. So I just shaved my beard. I, I have <laughs> I have shave regret. But like when you grow a beard, you have to just grow it out without tinkering with it for like three months, and it looks disgusting. <laughs> and only at that point can you then begin to pluck yeah. away at it. And it feels like maybe it's been something like that in the conservative movement, where it's like let's just bring everyone in, let's yeah. just attack this this censorship. But then once you've done that, it's like, okay, now we need to really decide what we are here. And I we think can't... that is where we are right now. And like that's why analogy? you're starting Wasn't to do. Random? I actually think that's <laughs> beautifully stated. That's where we are right now. I think that's why mm. people are starting to see a lot of infighting, so to speak. We're trying to come up with a definition for what is a conservative, kind of like the yeah. what is a woman question, ironically. But I don't think we really have an answer for that. And I don't think you're going to be able to do that unless you have reference to, to, to well, from my angle, God. And Absolutely. Christ and I Christianity 100% specifically. agree with you on that. Yeah, because if we don't know, if God, it, there's this wonderful line in the Second Vatican Council, I think it's Gaudium et Spes, that says, when God is forgotten, the creature itself grows unintelligible. Mm. So if there is no God, then what are we and what are we for? It seems like, well, we are what? Um, the result of time plus matter plus chance. We've evolved in this way. What are we for? Well, for has to do with teleology and that doesn't seem to make sense, at least in a mind independent way. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're for whatever we choose. And if you don't start with God and Christ, I don't know how you get anywhere uh, worth getting. Well, I think that's the perfect image of where we are right now in America, even in a more conservative realm of how we live our lives. We've been operational so secularly for so long that we have mm. become unintelligible. We can't even answer the question, what is a woman in our society, which is mm. the biggest joke of our time, arguably. But we certainly can't tackle some of the biggest human rights issues that we're dealing with, abortion and, mm. and what's happening with the border and continued crime rising in all of our cities. This is a huge problem that I don't know that we have the right answer for how to solve quite yet because we've lost that first step in the journey. But what is, has been encouraging to me is how many people, maybe of your generation, are embracing conservative Christianity and they don't want to be pandered to, they don't want like a concert, they mm -hmm. don't want a like entertaining speech. This is this is lovely. I, I really like, I enjoy talking about the d distinction, the differentiation between our generations because just before we went live, you helped me post something to Instagram because <laughs> I didn't know how to do that. And you asked, should I post it to your stories? And I said, I don't know what that means. You know, like, um, and it feels like when I grew up, it was very much about rebelling against the man, yeah. you know, and sticking it to authority where it feels like one of the reasons Jordan Peterson has been so successful is he seems to be saying, no, no, let's go back to tradition in a way. You know, I don't agree with everything he says, of course, but let's go back to the way uh, to time tested traditions mm -hmm. and hierarchy. And so I'm seeing this like eagerness and this determination and zeal on like my son, you know, Thursday, you others who who are as passionate about our country and conservative. I don't like the word values. I think values sounds sort of epistemologically relative. Mm. I like morals or truth facts, oh, I like you know, that. Um, but you're, you're as passionate about that as I was about like Metallica and giving the middle <laughs> finger to anybody for no particular reason. And it's, it's, it's kind of cool. What's funny to think about Matt is that is our version of that though. Like if you think about the cyclical nature of history throughout all of humanity, every young generation has always shared this common denominator of wanting to rebel against the people in charge. And sometimes that's looked mm -hmm. like the free spirit hippie movement when society was so structured and was so gridlocked. I think now we're on the opposite side of that. Our version of Metallica or Stick It to the Man is to rebel against the people in power. And if you look at every single cultural institution in our country today, the church, uh, entertainment, education, politics, our government, every aspect of our life is very loudly controlled by the radical, secularized, authoritarian left. So the only way to truly rebel against society and mm -hmm. stick it to the man, so to speak, is to embrace <laughs> traditional values, to fall in love, to get married, to start families, mm -hmm. to embrace very traditional Christianity. Um, I think most people don't know this because we assume Gen Z is this hyper atheist, godless generation. Believe me, spending a lot of time in politics, I hear the phrase, your generation is destroying America 20,000 times a day, which is just so far from the truth. If it were the truth, it would be our fault. Thank it you. It wouldn't be your fault. Thank you, like, Matt. You, know, you have very much a big brain attitude yeah. this. But nobody wants to admit that. Anyway, I digress. The interesting thing is, two years ago in 2021, only a quarter of Gen Zers said that they believed in any higher power. 
Okay. Only a quarter. Today, two years later, it's over a third that say we proudly believe in God. And Gen mm. Z is the most likely generation to prefer the traditional Latin mass. We do not want fog machines and rock concerts and drummers in cages. And mm -hmm. okay, everybody text Jesus to 54565 and close your eyes and raise your hand if you accepted Jesus today. Oh. We want reverence. We want tradition. We want the beauty of our history, right. our, our generational story yeah. of what it means to be Christian that I think we can really only find in the church. Here's an analogy. When I bought this house here in Steubenville, there was shag carpet everywhere. <laughs> White shag carpet in the dining Oof. room. The dining the room. The dining room. That's rough. And then there was a big bit of plastic, see-through plastic around the table. I thought this... Anyway, we ripped up all this disgusting carpet and there was, of course, beautiful uh, wood floors underneath. Yeah. You're like, who... Whoever came up with this is the same people who thought liturgical abuse was a good idea. Like, why would you make everything ugly? And that's exactly what society has done. I think it's been, to some degree, so accepting and so normal in many ways to be a Protestant Christian in America that it's become this anything goes, yeah. very half in, half out, secularized cultural even Christianity. Like an, it's, like a, it's like an Americanized exactly. view of Christianity. If you travel to any other cross, country in the, the world, cross, it is not like this. The cross means slightly more than the flag. That kind of feeling. I'm not saying anyone's saying that, but you do get that sense. As an Australian, I would actually go so far as to beg the op or to differ okay. with the opposite. I think many American Protestant Christians, namely evangelical Christians, have started to have this reverence for the flag that does supersede the cross. I talk about this with my mm. fiance all the time. He was raised Southern Baptist. He's now in RCIA and is becoming Catholic this spring, which I'm very excited for him about. Um, but we've noticed with a lot of our friends as he's been really open about his journey and so excited to join the church and learning more about our history as Christians throughout the last 2,000 years, many of our friends from the political world that we're kind of still involved with tangentially are having this reverence, this respect, this veneration for the founding fathers of our country that they do not have for the founding fathers of our church. In fact, they try to say, ah, Peter was just a guy and he's dead, so we shouldn't pay attention to him anyway. Or Mary, the mother of God, is just an ordinary person. She's dead, so you shouldn't even be talking to her anyway. She's not listening to you. There's this this beautiful reverence and respect for traditional conservative values and for mm -hmm. the founding fathers of our country that I think American conservatism secularly has nailed down very beautifully. But then you remotely try to bring tradition with a capital T into the conversation or the story of us as a church. And it's almost this like visceral, angry response from so many American Christians that I'm seeing because we've blended mm. tradition so much with the secular side of things. We can't recognize it in the church anymore. To your point about cyclical nature of generations, I guess I'm really glad, right, that I gave birth. I didn't give birth. My wife gave birth. <laughs> I more mean, specifically. it is 2023, Matt. Anything could <laughs> You could, could if you wanted. Um, you know, <laughs> into this generation where my children feel, feel, they actually feel the need to rebel against the LGBT stuff being thrust on them. Yep. I'm not the one telling them to do that. In fact, sometimes they react in a way that I'm like, ooh, okay, easy, charity, <laughs> love, you know, and they're like, no, forget it, burn everything. I'm like, oh, dear Lord. Um, I think Matt Walsh put it really well when he said, you know, when your seventh grade math teacher, Barbara, thinks that, you know, BLM is cool, it's no longer cool. Exactly. And exactly. So that need to rebel against the people in charge, the people in power has always been there. It's just manifesting in a very surprising way with Gen Z. Mm. And you see that all over the place culturally as well. I just wrote a book about this. It's coming out in March. Yes. Um, so I'm very excited. Just tell me the, about it. Yeah. It's called The End of the Alphabet, which I actually really I like that. because I don't think it's coincidental. We are Gen Z. We're at the end of the alphabet and we're mm. also kind of at the end of life as we know it. But a lot of people would tell you that's a bad thing. I argue it's a really good thing to be at the end of life as we know it. Uh, one in five Americans say the Constitution was inspired by God. Yeah. Okay. Exciting stuff. Interesting stuff. Uh, but Gen Z is doing this exciting new thing that you're seeing with your children right now. Yeah. We're kind of breaking all the rules, but reorganizing them into a new age tradition, if that makes sense. We're bringing back traditional values with a modern spin. Oh, when you say new age. Not, in, not in the other yeah. context, but bringing back our, our story and our history as a country, but also as people throughout all of the greatest dynasties of all of human history. And we're trying to put our own spin on it generationally. So, for mm. example, we're rejecting the idea you have to go get a four-year degree in 
underwater lesbian basket weaving and spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars to do that in I order hope, to I be hope successful. That's actually, a course somewhere. <laughs> I that hope is, it is. I'm sure so it is good, at this yeah. point. <laughs> or Taylor Swift lyrics, right? I'm sure you could oh get a degree goodness, in that these yeah. days. We don't feel the need to do that in order to quote unquote be successful in America. Similarly, we don't feel the need to go be an unpaid intern somewhere and mm. then maybe get hired for twenty thousand dollars a year and then maybe after forty years of proving your loyalty to your work family, your corporation, you might get a really great promotion and a great raise. We're just starting out on day one as being CEOs. 62% of us have already started our own business. But I was, but the reason you're doing that isn't right. It's because of the internet that's enabled it. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. We And we're using the internet for right. all of the right things. Most of us work three or four side gigs on top of our normal jobs because mm. of the internet on social media or contract work or whatever. Uh, we're deleting all of our dating apps. Nobody knows Tell this, but this. Gen Z is throwing away hookup culture. We want nothing to do with it. We're deleting all of our dating apps and Pew Research is actually doing a lot of great reporting on this about how dating app companies are freaking out how to cater to Gen Z because no we're way. not the repeat customers that millennials were. Is that were. because you're all watching porn? Partially, I do think that's contributing to it. And that's a massive, massive cultural problem most people are totally unwilling to talk about because it's so uncomfortable and we don't like to talk about uncomfortable subjects, especially in the church. But yes, porn has become incredibly normalized for our generation. But for whatever the reason we're getting here, at the very least, we're looking around at how society is telling us to date to never, ever, ever commit to someone, to sleep with as many people as possible, to be mm -hmm. always on hormonal birth control, certainly never get married. That's going to destroy your chances of having a great career. If you do happen to get pregnant, Planned Parenthood will just take care of it for you. It's just an inconvenience. Please don't worry about it. And we're saying we want nothing to do with it. I wonder it. if this is one of the most dichotomous sort of generations. Like, I'm sure on one side, you do have people who are like, yay, Planned Parenthood, yay, sleeping around, bragging about my body count, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, whereas I, I wonder if, have you thought about that? If this generation has that divide in a way that other generations haven't? I think externally it appears that we do. But just a few months ago, for example, I flew to Santa Barbara to be on the Whatever podcast. I don't I'm know sorry. if you've seen clips of that, but it's been fantastic. Breaks my heart. It was show. actually a fantastic I'd episode. Be, I'd be willing to go on if all of the women wore jackets and didn't dress like whores. Yeah, that's a fair, yeah. fair presumption of yeah. how the show typically operates. And I was going into it with the same mentality. Very defensive. As we were standing outside of the studio and making really awkward small talk, everybody was like, oh, I don't really know what to say to you because I'm sure we're going to yell at each other other in a few minutes but for five and a half hours matt we sat around this table and i'm across the table from an only fans creator and from an active prostitute literally oh, from a recovering sex addict like everything you can possibly imagine and every single girl around that table said she had quit her birth control within the last year because it was destroying her life that modern feminism was lying to them about what they really should want out of life and they feel like they've been gypped out of the what porn performers happiness are actually this. yes okay. actually You're saying like getting warmer, i'm not warmer. happy i'm miserable yeah. i'm sick all the time I don't feel like I have great relationships with men. Did you suggest to them another way? Absolutely. And they all said, okay, I might consider that. I don't know that they'll ever like fully get there in the next few months, but what an incredible opportunity. On the outset, you think these people are so divided and they hate each other and we have nothing in common. Okay. We're really hurting as a generation right now. Everybody's hurting. And mm. even people that you would think are like these demonic leftists that are possessed by all these crazy lies of society, they're broken people and they're yeah. looking for reason. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for truth. And they're mm. not finding it anywhere in those cultural pillars I mentioned earlier, education, entertainment, Hollywood. They're not seeing it in their jobs. They're not seeing it in corporate America. They certainly aren't seeing it in politics. So really the only next answer is God. Where can we find that through mm -hmm. God? And I think that's why our generation is returning to the Catholic Church in droves. We have a record number of RCIA applicants this year in the Miami diocese. Mm. We just did our prepared for marriage retreat a couple of weekends ago with 52 other Gen Z couples getting married in the Catholic Church. And it was just shocking. And what's the sense you get from these 50 other couples? Are They're they, tired are they of the in? world. They're yeah. tired of the world and we're yeah. looking for something bigger. So wow. you might think we're this very divided generation. We hate mm -hmm. each other. We hate everything about the other that we can never get along on anything. I actually see nothing but opportunity for Gen Z because this we're is, already starting such, to get it. This is such the attitude of youth though. I love it. It's so beautiful because I'm tired. Yep. I, I should have a show called Get Off My Lawn if uh, Gavin <laughs> McGinnis didn't already have that. Yep. But that's that's beautiful to yeah, hear. it is. But I mean, there's obviously a polarized, maybe the, maybe the internet makes it seem all the more polarizing, but you obviously have people who are promoting all sorts of crazy things. And, and it's not just, you know, some people say you've never met anyone who's trans. And I'm like, okay, I have a family member who's a woman who thinks she's a man who just got married 
on Friday the 13th and had a had a blood and gore wedding. Are you serious? Yes. God bless this beautiful person. Wow. Who's an extended family member. You know, like, so I, I'm seeing... How do you decorate for a blood and gore wedding? I just, I don't care. <laughs> I, I just pray for her. Yeah, yeah. It's what you have to do, I guess. Yeah, but, you know, when I had Michael Knowles on the show in the Cigar Lounge, he, he we came up with this idea, I don't know if it was him or myself, and but I, I keep bringing it up. This idea of giving people an off-ramp is so important because if you've had, let's use the example of an abortion mm-hmm. or quote-unquote tran- you know, transgender surgery, my lord, now you've got two decisions to make. Do I continue to justify this action yep. or do I not? Now, if I don't, I have to admit I've made a terrible mistake. And in the case of abortion, I have to admit that I've paid someone to kill my innocent child. That's a big bloody hurdle to jump over. And what would be easier instead of going down that path is the path of, you know, this is healthcare, mm-hmm. and I am a liberated woman. And those people, are, that's so much easier. And all of us can understand this since we're all wretched sinners who've made bad choices in our own ways. And we all understand what it's like to have to either admit that we're wrong or double down on the stupid thing that we did. But I love your attitude there of how do we give these these lovely, as you said, these broken women who've been raised in a pornified society. Yeah. How do we give them an off ramp? And not just shout at them. So- I think it's so profound to remember to look at people as people. We've been so trained in the last five years. I wouldn't even say 10 years, but the last five years to look at somebody who disagrees with you and say they're less of a human than me because we have literally nothing in common. I should not be listening to them. They should not be listening to me. I'm going to cut all ties to that person and just basically pretend that they don't exist. I have nothing in common with them anymore. I'm seeing that in the political world right now with just labeling anybody on the left as demonic and they're not worth our time and they're true evil. Mm -hmm. I actually think a lot of people are just really misled. A lot of people are very broken. They've been lied to from every single direction in society, maybe even within their own family. And they're trying to figure out what to do with that. They're trying to figure Mm -hmm. out how to wrestle with these feelings, maybe of guilt and shame from decisions that they've made in their past. Maybe they are continuing to feel very broken in the actions that they're living with every day that society says is empowering or liberating, but they really deep down feel, no, it's not. Something's wrong with this picture. If we can't give those people a way to go, we're really negating the entire story of our faith, of redemption, of walking away from sin. Jesus, for example, everybody likes to say, always hung out with sinners. He ate with sinners. He loved to call sinners to his ministry, but he never left them as sinners. He always Mm. said, go and sin no more. And from that day forward, they were on a path to sainthood. And I think we've forgotten that missing link of redemption in our secularized society. We just say, "Ah, sorry, too bad for you. You made a bad decision once and you're not going to ever be a part of my club or my side or my team ever again. It's a good point. Like I said earlier, with whoever feels themselves to be the oppressed is crying out for free speech, whether it be right or left. I think also it's the case that um, conservatives have said, and I even saw this on a Daily Wire backstage a couple of years ago. I think it was, um, who's the fella who runs Daily Wire? What, there's three three of them, but who's the fella? Jeremy. Jeremy, yeah. Jeremy said, the difference between us and the left is we think you're wrong and you think we're evil. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's far too cute. No, that's not the case. It's clearly the case that conservatives are looking at the left and going, you're clearly evil. This is what I'm, do you know what I'm saying? So, I'm seeing more of that with every yeah. passing day. And I think a lot of it's just stemming from frustration, to be honest with yeah, you. But it's a lot easier. Yeah, if you just call someone, it's like, it's like 10 step, it's a thou, it's a infinity steps up from calling someone Hitler. Yeah. You're literally Satan. You are literally <laughs> demonic and I'm never going to talk to yeah. you again. I see a lot of that. But I, I'm also starting to see that spill over now into the Christian world in America and fracturing every denomination of our faith even. So even if you think, oh, we're on the same side or we're mm-hmm. voting for the same people so they're naturally going to share all of my values in the last year and a half or so i've been feeling this like deep-seated soul pull away from the world of secular politics and more into what's happening culturally in our country and specifically Mm. with my faith so when i went independent with all of my content this spring a big focus of that was to talk more oh very openly about my story of being catholic about my fiance and his journey Mm. through rcia real quick you say going independent you may have already said it but who were you with prior to going oh yes i have worked with several different political companies in the past my first job was with prager u right out of college i worked full-time for turning point off 
off and on for a few different years Mm -hmm. um, and still do some contract work for them. Uh, I do a little bit of contract work with Students for Life. So like I said, I wear very many hats. But um, in March, I really decided no more Mm. uh, full-time jobs, no more nine to fives. I will figure out how to pay for everything. God will make that happen. And he did. So thank Mm. goodness. Definitely lots of sweaty nights over that one, thinking Mm. about how to pay my rent. But um, I just felt this this very God-given need to own what I was saying, to be 100% transparent and authentic about everything that I was posting on the internet instead of doing it for another company or posting what somebody else was telling me to say. And a big part of that was because of my faith. I've noticed in the last two years or so, so much anti-Catholic sentiment in the secular really? conservative political world really that is so misinformed and very much not based in reality in the, in the whatsoever political world, you're in saying. the political world all the time. And I think a lot of it stems from this same thing of anyone who disagrees with me politically is demonic. Mm. We've embraced that same very hard shell exterior to say anyone who's not my denomination of Christianity is demonic. Anyone who doesn't interpret scripture the exact same way that I do is demonic. The Catholic Church is run by literally Satan or literally the Antichrist, which I've heard right. a thousand times this week, for example. Yeah. Um, and it's very disconcerting to me because I think we've been operational on the defensive for so long that now mm. we just feel defensive about everything. And when okay. we are confronted with truth that might differ from what we thought was truth, we don't know how to respond to that. I also think it's us pulling ourselves out of ambiguity and no longer being willing to settle for reasonable ambiguity. Absolutely correct. So I'm, I, I can't cannot live like that. I cannot live in chaos. There must be order. And we come up with these really rigid categories about who's in and who's out Mm -hmm. uh, without, yeah, without kind of extending charity towards the other. That's interesting. You mentioned, for example, if you've gone through a surgery and you might identify yourself as transgender, are those people just supposed to live that way and go Mm -hmm. deeper and deeper and deeper into that ideology forever? This week, we had a lot of big headlines go pretty viral when the church reaffirmed the same teaching from the last 2000 years that anyone and everyone is invited to be baptized in the Catholic Church. If you leave your life of sin behind, if you promise and vow to denounce Satan and all of his works, you too can choose to walk towards sainthood instead of a life of sin. And specifically, our secular media twisted that to say, the Pope said transgender people can be Catholic and be godparents and be witnesses at a wedding. How dare they? That's completely blasphemy. That's a heresy. This Pope is the Antichrist. And I saw so many well-meaning Christian friends in my life who might not be Catholic, but various denominations of Protestantism, echo those same sentiments that if you are a Catholic, you are straight on the path to hell. Many posts about that. If you follow the tradition from the last 2000 years of our faith, uh, you are not interpreting the Bible correctly and you will be punished for that. You are a sinner. Mm -hmm. You are giving into Satan. Are we that hard shelled? And do we have that so much of a built up exterior of being defensive that we can look at each other, no matter how badly we've sinned and say, you're condemned forever. Sorry. You can never choose to let that go and move forward. That broke my heart this week to see how many people had no concept of redemption, mm-hmm. especially for people in our generation who might be children being like forced into transition surgeries and hormones from parents or their mm-hmm. principal at school and being manipulated into things. They might not be even choosing that for themselves. Are we really going to look at an 18 year old girl who transitioned and then decided this is not for me? This is not right. This isn't who mm-hmm. God made me to be and say that there's no place for you in our church. I hope not. I would hope that we have the ability to look at them with compassion to say, you've been duped, you've been lied to by this world, but there's hope for you. There's a grace for you. There's an opportunity for redemption for you. But I've seen so many, again, well-meaning Christians wanting to protect the dogma of faith and wanting to protect what we believe in say, there's the door. Yes, um, I'm thinking of that line from Scripture. Oh, wow, okay, ways. sorry about that. I'm thinking <laughs> of that line in Scripture. I'd like to find it where our blessed Lord says, uh, you know, the, the love of many will grow cold. Yeah. And it seems like that's what might be happening here because we want to maintain both kindness and truth. But in a day and age where you feel like you're under attack by lies, you can, you can lose charity for each other. Absolutely. Yeah. It's gotten me really thinking more about my platform and the content that I'm putting out there. Like, why am I doing this? And it's Mm -hmm. always been to tell the truth. That's always been what I've wanted to do ever since I was a kid. But I'm seeing such a bigger need in society and culture today, not to tell people who to vote for for president or what the heck's happening with this bill in Congress, but to talk to people about their souls. I mean, we are really dealing with a spiritual level of warfare that I think the average person doesn't like to think about Mm -hmm. every day. It makes us uncomfortable. We don't like to think about the things that we can't see with our own two eyes. But 
even within the Americanized church, we're really condemning each other to hell today. That's what we're doing instead of pursuing truth and pursuing God. That's very disconcerting to me. Here's the scripture from Matthew 24. Many, oh yeah. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Mm -hmm. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Wow. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Most. Yeah. That's telling. Yeah, and, and why? Hmm. Why is our love growing cold? That's very interesting. Because of the increase of wickedness. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. And I think it's just for the, well, one interpretation that seems reasonable to me is the one we're kind of talking about now. You see wickedness and you hate the wickedness and you attack the wickedness uh, and you forget that the wickedness is sometimes attached to a person for whom yeah. Christ died and the love grows cold. And so now you just become about what's true, what's factual, without kind of concern for the other. I think it was Edith Stein who said, you know, neither kindness without truth or truth without kindness. It's, it, yeah. Truth easy, in easy love. To say, yeah. Eh? Easy to say, but difficult to do. Yeah. Dif very difficult to do. My goodness gracious. So are you seeing people converting? I am. Left, right, and center. I'm seeing yep. it everywhere. And I think that's really inspiring to me because the more I have seen the one true church just completely under attack in the American Christianized world, the more I'm seeing people at least start to ask the right questions. Mm. And there's this curiosity that's forming in so many people who even themselves might have agreed with some of the loudest voices posting anti-Catholic sentiment on Instagram or anything, reaching out to me quietly behind the scenes and saying, this feels odd. Something feels weird about this. I'm starting to ask some questions. I read this book or I watched this video and mm -hmm. now I have a lot more questions. Can you help me get to the next step? Uh, it's really been an in incredible journey for myself because I never would have dreamed that God would be using you know my content on Instagram to try to get people thinking about their faith or thinking mm -hmm. about Catholicism. Uh, but it's led me to really reevaluate a lot of things in my own life and what content I'm posting and what I'm wanting to be doing as a creator to create for him, not just for likes and for views and new followers on Instagram. Um, but I'm even considering like a master's in theology now because I just have so many people asking me questions that I think I have good answers to, but I want more. I have more questions. I'm falling more in love with our faith and I don't think I'll ever stop having that level of curiosity grow. How do you, how do you personally struggle with what to post? And you know, people sometimes say the, use the word struggle in the wrong way. For example, someone will say, "I'm struggling with pornography," and you're like, "Are you? I hope you are." <laughs> yeah, I hope. Is there any struggle, or are yeah. you just sort of giving in? Doing right? it. Yeah. So what I'm asking you is like, wh how do you struggle? You know, because in order to play the YouTube game, you need to get the clicks, you need yeah. to get the eyeballs, and yet at the same time, I like what you're saying that you went independent of, and are feeling more of a freedom to be able to post what you feel will be actually actually benefit people. It's a difficult balance to play. I do a lot of reaction content, so I'll pull mm -hmm. crazy stuff from the depths of TikTok, the dark side <laughs> of TikTok you don't want to be on and react to that. And it's very effective. It gets a lot of views, but mm. I always try to follow it up with something like this is really sad or this person is really broken and we should be trying to reach them with the truth. Mm. There's such a tendency, I think, to try to own the other side, and that's how you go super viral, right? You'll get 14 million views on your video when you're on a college campus and somebody screams in your face and you drop mm -hmm. a one-liner and everybody goes, oh, in the audience. Mm -hmm. But that's not effective in actually changing that person's mind. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it starts with the humanity piece and seeing you're really broken. You're really hurting. I can see that in you. I want better for you. Mm -hmm. Let's try to maybe pivot and go in a different direction. So it is funny and it's always fun to react to some of those videos, but I'm always very intentional to try to follow it up with a greater message of where do we go from here? We can't leave those people where they're at. Um, I do a lot of work in the pro-life movement as well. Mm -hmm. I joined Kristen Hawkins, who is the founder of Student Students for Life on her speaking tour last spring, went to over a dozen college campuses to talk about the biggest lies that the abortion industry is telling the people of my generation. What are and they? there were tons. We had 10 or 11, so there were a lot. Uh, oh, but that men of. can give birth or that birth control is going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. Obviously, all of the lies specifically about abortion. And it was fascinating because we had 
very, very extreme protests. At one campus in particular, Antifa came and tried to attack people at our event, punched a 19-year-old girl in the face. Mm. Uh, It was really intense. And we had to be put into a safe room and locked in there while the protesters got to roam around free. It was a very backwards society. But at every single one of those events, there were women after women after women after women in my generation with the hats on and all the crazy shirts and Mm. the posters that they were coming to yell at us and scream at us. But something in them at least got them to stand in line and ask a question. And we encourage anybody, if you disagree, come to the front of the line, skip the whole line Mm -hmm. and ask us a question because we want to have a real conversation that's not happening on campuses anymore. And every single time we had those real conversations, I could see something happening behind the eyes of these women who say, well, what about my career? And what about my ability to sleep with as many people as possible? And what about the fact that I never want to get married? And what if I'm just not ready to have a baby? That's my body. And that's there was this anger. But then as you talk to somebody and you don't get angry, you don't yell back at them. It's not a debate per se. It's a conversation. There's this softness that comes into people and they say, oh, you're not an enemy. You're not the person I was told was going to bring back Hitler to my college campus. I don't need to be screaming at you. Maybe you actually do have a really good point. And they might not agree with what I'm saying in that moment, but I have no doubt in my mind those people will go back to their dorm rooms or they'll go back to their apartments and Mm -hmm. over five, six months really ruminate on what we talked about. And sometimes it's just about that first step to connect on the humanity, to connect on the empathy and the feelings before you hit them with all the facts, don't care about your feelings. Mm. That gets people thinking and moving in the right direction. So, uh, okay, I mean, that's a subjective experience you had, that this person's listening to me, maybe the gears are turning. But have you ever seen proof of that, where people have listened to you, ruminated on what you've said and have begun to change their mind? I love this question because, yes, I see it all the time. But there's one story in particular that blew my expectations out of the water for what were what was possible. Way back when on my college campus, one of the students in student government who sent a death threat to me, mm. the one who said I was a Nazi and said all Nazis deserve to be shot in the head, um, huh was very, very vehemently against every single thing I ever said. He was literally registered to vote with the Communist Party. I didn't even know you could do that at Mm. the time, but you can. Raised by a hyper-secular leftist family, believed in no concept of private property. The government should come seize everyone's private property, like extreme Mm. communist leftist. And we had gotten to know each other over a few years, but it was always a very weird relationship, especially after he sent that death threat uh, to a mutual (laughs) friend of ours. Definitely strains it. Yeah, definitely difficult to get along with people. But I just always kept showing up, treating him with kindness, respect. He's just, you know, a person. He's clearly a very broken person with a lot of bad ideas, but he's still a person. And I'll Mm -hmm. wave at him in the office and say hi or whatever. Um, I self-published my first book in 2021. So I graduated from undergrad in 2019. My book came out in February of 2021 about all of my experiences on campus. What's it called? Uh, Frontlines, Finding My Voice on an American College Campus. And I decided to kick off my book tour on college campuses at my alma mater. So I went back. It was super fun. Got to see a lot of my friends who were a few years younger than me. My sister was there at the time uh, in her junior or senior year at CSU. And at the end of the event, after I gave my speech, I was signing books and sitting at a table with my head down, ferociously scribbling and saying, thank you guys for coming. And this guy strolls up to the table wearing cowboy boots and a big old belt buckle, which was not abnormal at all for our college. There's a big agricultural program. So I'm thinking it's somebody in the ag school or somebody that maybe was a ram handler with me. I do a lot of side quests. I was a a handler for our live mascot, the ram. Uh, It was very fun. Uh (laughs) But I'm scribbling and scribbling and I look up and it's this guy. This guy who usually is wearing Che Guevara t-shirts and like screaming on college campuses. And he has this softened appearance about himself and he's wearing the boots and the belt buckle and a pearl snap shirt. Like looking very Western, conservative, Uh agricultural. And he starts to hand me a book to sign. And what's really embarrassing is I actually screenshotted the text that he sent and I published it in the book. So I'm thinking, don't read that. Don't read that, please. That's so awkward. But he started to hand it to me and he holds back and he says, I just want to tell you before I ask you to sign this, I am so profoundly sorry for how I treated you in college. It was completely unacceptable. I didn't really know what I was doing. Frankly, I didn't even really know what I believed in. It's just what I had always been raised with. And until I met you, no one in my life, none of my professors, certainly not my parents, never any of my friends, nobody had ever even exposed me to a different perspective. 
let alone like tried to tell me that their perspective was right. And so I was wow. really viscerally uncomfortable when you tried to do that. But it at least got me thinking, because even after I sent you a death threat, and again, I'm thinking, please don't read that in the book. That's so embarrassing. Yeah, uh, even after that happened, that yeah, page, I should have just specifically ripped that one out. <laughs> oh, yeah, probably. Um, even after I sent that to you, you still showed up in our student government office and you were smiling and you were happy and you still believed in all of the same things. And I just kept thinking, who is that diabolical to keep being happy and keep <laughs> <laughs> believing in what they believe in after I just called her a Nazi and said we should shoot her in the head. That's insane. And it got me to ask questions. And then I'm thinking, whoa, this is insane. I never would have predicted this in you of all people. He then goes on to say, uh, I now am registered to vote with the Republican Party. I voted for Donald Trump. And I'm like, what is happening? I own three firearms and I got my concealed carry permit. And this was the same guy saying we should have no private gun ownership. We shouldn't even have private property a few years earlier. Uh, and you changed changed my entire life and I want to thank you for that just by showing up and and doing your thing believing in your values and not being afraid to back down friendly kindly respectfully but I never would have even had the opportunity to ask mm -hmm. those questions if it wasn't for you so no matter who you think you're talking to they might seem so incredibly hostile towards your ideas you never know what's happening in the behind the scenes in their own private life and maybe they're acting that hostile and angry because they're so uncomfortable with being presented with an idea they've never been told before maybe they've lived their entire life outside of the bounds of objective truth and this is the first time they've even heard there is an objective truth in our very very subjective society mm -hmm. you never know how that might change the course of somebody's life yeah a long time ago i decided never to expect anybody to change their mind in front of me yep and I think uh, that's part of the frustration of these conversations is we kind of expect, I'll just lay out these scripture texts if I'm arguing with a Protestant or something like mm -hmm. that, or uh, these philosophical proofs if I'm arguing with an atheist and they're going to change their mind in front of me. And that, you know, that n almost never happens. And so not to expect that and not to be disappointed when it doesn't happen. I think the most crazy experience I've had was I was giving a talk at the Basilica in Baltimore. You'll stop me if I've told you this or if you've No, heard. I haven't heard this, I don't think. And I was giving a talk on pornography specifically. Well, a porn performer slash prostitute came to my talk. No way. Yeah. And so we had a time of Q&A and uh, she raised her hand and uh, told me, why I was wrong and that I'm painting the lives of these women as unhappy, miserable creatures when that's just not true. She's very happy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what was interesting is a fella in front of her felt so uncomfortable that he, to his great shame, I think, stood up and shouted at her. Mm. And so I told him to get out of the church. <laughs> so I kind of shouted at him and I apologized to her and I allowed her to continue. And then my answer was essentially, you're wrong to yeah. be happy. Like, you're not happy. I know you think you are, but you're wrong to you're be happy. You're not really happy. Yeah. And she kept interrupting me. And I said, just wait. I promise you I'll let you have the last word. And so I kind of laid out my case. And then I let her have the last word. And the last word was why I was wrong and her reason for why mm -hmm. I was wrong. And then I said, okay, thank you very much. And we closed in prayer and I didn't respond. But it was a really cool, I think it was a cool option because a lot of people were grateful for how I treated her. And I think she felt respected. And it was lovely to be able to defend this poor woman from this poor fella who actually came back after my talk and apologized to mm. me. But, um, well, yeah, what, what's the point of that? Well, just that it was a crazy story, I suppose, and that we should really try to treat people with charity because, I mean, w what, what do you think was better? You know, me allowing her to talk and showing her why I thought she was wrong or standing up and shouting at her like... I don't know how many people have been told you're an idiot, get out, and then went, oh, wow, I just totally I need to change my, my whole life. I think even bigger than that is the people sitting in the audience who aren't willing to get in line and ask questions, but mm -hmm. they're curious and they want answers to some of these things too. Mm -hmm. How you interact with the people who are brazen enough to come up and yell at you or say something to you impacts mm -hmm. all of those people in the audience too, and you never know what's happening there. When I had that happen to me when somebody came and said, you changed my whole lifestyle, all of my values, etc., that's really rare, 99.999 percent of the time you're yeah. not going to see the end result of what you do today so i think acting with intention and very very specifically treating people with respect tell them the truth but tell them the truth in love mm -hmm. it's so so important in our very angry society i want to tell you about a course that i have created for men to overcome pornography it is called strive21.com slash matt you go there right now, or if you text STRIVE to 66866, we'll send you the link. It's 100% free, 
And it's a course I've created to help men to give them the tools to overcome pornography. Usually men know that porn is wrong. They don't need me or you to convince them that it's wrong. What they need is a battle plan to get out. And so I've distilled all that I've learned over the last 15 or so years as I've been talking and writing on this topic into this one course. Think of it as if you and I could have a coffee over the next 21 days and I would kind of guide you along this journey. That's basically what this is. It's incredibly well produced. Uh, we had a whole camera crew come and film this. Um, and I think it'll be a really a real help to you. And it's also not an isolated course that you go through on your own because literally tens of thousands of men have now gone through this course. And as you go through the different videos, there's comments from men all around the world encouraging each other, offering to be each other's accountability partners and things like that. Strive21, that's strive21.com slash Matt, or as I say, text, text strive to 66866 to get started today. You won't regret it. What's interesting is I think it's I think it's more appropriate to be aggressive, and by aggressive I don't mean physically aggressive, but like orally aggressive when arguing with a man than it is a woman. Yes, like it's a I completely hate different seeing strategy. Seeing a man argue with a woman and being aggressive, but what's been interesting is to see these clips of Matt Walsh being very aggressive as he talks to what looks like a woman. <laughs> exactly. And I find myself being like, "How dare you talk? Oh, that's a dude. It's not a woman. Who's mocking actually. a woman? <laughs> May not be intending to mock a woman, but it seems." more offensive than blackface in my estimation. So it's, I, I remind myself, it is interesting. I think men do appreciate being spoken to in a more of aggressive manner if they believe that the speaker has their best interest in mind. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I mean, how, how many women talks do you go to where the one on the stage is like, suck it up and be better? Like there's a lot of men's talks where we're told that and we love it. Yeah. But again, we love it because to use an example of Jordan Peterson, we like we think he loves us. We think he wants what's best for us, right? So when he says like, "Get your shit together," and you're let's, like, yeah. you're like, "Thank you," I, you're right. I, <laughs> but I, I, I've often thought, not being a woman, how how women must take that because when I hear women give talks to other women, I don't hear anything like that. And I, I wonder either that well, women need to hear that. Like, mm -hmm. be a better wife. You're terrible. <laughs> you say, "Well, I can't cook." Get a frigging cookbook, right? <laughs> Or do women just not react well to that kind of thing? You know, it's funny. It makes me think of how women and men fight with each other, right? If you're around mm -hmm. a married couple who's been married for 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. your parents or your grandparents uh, who might have even been married longer, women always have this cliche that it's not what you said, it's how you said it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the delivery is so important, even more than the substance sometimes mm -hmm. in how you reach women because newsflash we are different right men and women are not the same god created us very differently and very intentionally differently because we operate on our intuition we operate on our empathy we operate on our feelings much yeah. more than men do I, just a real quick insert there that might be true but i don't think it's unreasonable to object to somebody based on how they said something i think that's a completely reasonable thing that men need to take stock of no absolutely yeah. i totally agree with that i think it's just in marrying the facts and the feelings sure. side of things together yeah. that's the missing link that i think is going to be the game changer for how to reach generation z with truth in a truthless okay. world interestingly young men who are seniors in high school right now so we're talking about 17 to 18 year olds are overwhelmingly conservative like there are polls everywhere, and I say conservative in more of the secular sense, sure. but also in the religious sense, they're wanting this traditional conservative mm -hmm. Catholic uh, lifestyle in their Christian faith as well. But um, when it comes to how they're voting and the policies that they might support in our government, overwhelmingly are leaning towards the very, very, very right. And what I think- it, what, how, Where are these polls being- There's a ton of them, um, but one just came out, ah, oh, shoot. It was a big study that's been conducted since the 1970s. No problem. And I, I can't remember the name of it. I talked about head, it on my stream literally yesterday, so okay. you can go look it up. But it's um, a fascinating analysis because there are many that are now backing this one up that one just recently said only 28% of high school senior boys would consider themselves to be liberal. That's only right, 28%, which blows my mind because yeah. we live in this time where everyone's saying your generation is ruining society and they're these blue haired freaks that don't even know mm -hmm. their own gender. That's really not true for men at the very least. Men are very much overreacting to what's happening in society and wanting to bring masculinity back. And I think a lot of that has to do with the Ben Shapiro's and the Matt 
Matt Walsh's and the Jordan Peterson's of the world who have taken this very aggressive approach Mm -hmm. and the facts don't care about your feelings highway that's been so effective for men because men operate outside of the realm of emotions. You guys think about one thing at a time. This goes back to my science neuroanatomy root. This is definitely true. You have the nothing box, which I fundamentally cannot understand. Like if you're listening to this right now and your husband or your boyfriend or fiance says, I'm thinking about nothing, he's probably actually thinking about nothing. He's not lying to Mm. you. Don't make up ideas in your brain. But men have the capacity to do that that women don't. I I think this is right. And the more more I've gotten to know my good wife, the more I've seen this to be the case. Someone used the analogy of, well, even take, for example, our different laptops. You open up my laptop, I might have two windows open. She has 18,000 windows open. (laughs) Actually, I did a a live, I did a uh, Skype chat with Ori, our friend from Locals, and she shared her screen with me and I nearly fainted (laughs) seeing how many tabs she had pulled up there. She has the worst tabs I've ever seen. That's like a good analogy maybe for the male and female brain where my wife's thinking of a thousand things at once and Mm -hmm. I really only can think of one or two things. Yeah, you have one tab open and then when you're ready to move to the next tab, you close that one. Yes, We open up 40,000 tabs at the exact same time, which is why things all run together. So I actually just had a really interesting conversation recently with Charlie Kirk about this, about we're winning with young men because men are responsible to the facts of things. They're responding to the aggressive approach. They're Ah. responding to the more 30,000 foot level of things. I think we're really losing with women and the polls are exactly the opposite with women my age. They are increasingly more and more and more liberal with time, which I find interesting uh, because we're negating all of the emotion in the conversation. And I think there's a need to mirror and marry those things because we're not robots. We're not computers. We're not animatronic algorithms that operate outside of feelings. We have souls and we were created that that way for a reason to have empathy with one another to see God in somebody else because that's how God created them right in his own image and we're missing be, all of that I think this is true of both men and women I mean maybe it's more true with women I don't know but I mean advertisements if it was merely about the facts they would just list bullet points on their advertisements with like here are the links to click to follow up on the studies that show that this is the most reliable automobile or something like yeah. that no all adverts first prey upon your feelings and then Hopefully your feelings align with Mm -hmm. something that's true. Yeah, like a car advertisement. Think about that, for example. I drive a Jeep Wrangler. I'm a very Colorado girl through and through. It's my Mm -hmm. dream car. I love my car. Every time you're on TV watching football on Sunday afternoon, if you see a Jeep commercial, they're driving through the rugged mountains on a four-wheel drive trail in Colorado, and it speaks to your sense of adventure. Jeep people seem to be women. This is true. This is true. This (laughs) bothered me immensely because about four years ago, I bought a Jeep Wrangler. Did you really? I thought, what a manly car. How cool am I? Not cool. (laughs) Because every Jeep I passed, there was a Sheila in the front. And you tell me what this means. They have rubber duckies on the dashboard. I do not like this. I'm so glad you asked. I love the ducky thing. And I just had to explain this to my fiance. We were at the (laughs) store. And you know, at the front of the store in Target, there's like the little dollar stop or whatever, where things are super cheap. We were looking for a white elephant gift for his family gift exchange coming up. And I saw the cutest little rubber duckies on sale for a dollar and I just gathered as many of them up as I could because there's this tradition that I didn't learn until I bought a Jeep Wrangler that you duck other people's Jeeps so when you see a Jeep out and around town you take a rubber ducky and you put it on the handle of their driver's side door so you collect them over time because other random people have given you a duck as part of the Jeep club it's the same reason we do the Jeep wave when we drive I hate that so much I can't even (laughs) express it to you so I'm really glad maybe it is more of a woman thing I don't know yeah I want like He-Man figurines maybe there you, you know? go it's i have a, a cute little hula doll. girl on my dashboard she's there you cute go. Well, thank you for explaining that to me because i've wondered what the bloody hell's going on how do we oh how do we get onto jeeps yeah oh, feelings feelings your sense of adventure right yeah. the the commercials the advertisements even posts that you see on social media it's all uh-huh. very adventurous outdoorsy people they want to get out in nature they're not confined to the city life they're super exciting people mm-hmm. that's why people buy that car because it speaks towards that sense of lifestyle that sense of culture that sense of adventure that is deep seated in your emotions and how your personality is structured. What we're doing in politics, and I think what we do in content creation, even larger than politics, is we're selling ideas. We're selling concepts. We're selling Mm. values. And I think we forget about the marketing piece of that quite often because most people out there really don't know what camp they belong to. They really don't know what party best suits their values. They really don't know who to follow on social media. And escaping some of the realm of working in that nine to five every single day has been very eye-opening for me in this last year and a half or so, making more friends through our church or getting to know people in Miami since I've moved there. Most people don't watch Ben Shapiro or Matt Walsh 
every single day, 365 days a year. And I hope not, right? I'm sure Matt would hope not. (laughs) It's just a lot to take in. And most people have jobs. Most people have families. Like they don't have time to constantly be invested in every single piece of news or commentary Mm. or political argument that's happening on the internet every day. So when you're selling ideas to those people who aren't watching every single day, there is a level of marketing that has to go with that. We've clearly nailed it with young men. They're very much buying into everything that we're saying. But I think we're missing mm. the vehicle for how to market those ideas to young women, which is our emotions and feeling. Yeah, I really like that. I'm nervous about the impression we're giving to young men. I just saw an excellent uh, short the other day from this woman who was saying that all these red pill guys that she's dated. Sorry, I did not mean to so viscerally roll no, my eyes no, there. No, you yet. were right to. You were right to, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, but they're all they're all streamers. Like we we stream things. Is that what you said? Stream, like I'm a live streamer. Streamers? Yeah. Like, oh, how, I mean, I know I am, so I, I know it's hypocritical you're to say right this. You're streaming right now. <laughs> right. But it does feel kind of unmasculine if you're going to walk around pounding your chest saying that uh, women are this or that marriage is this yeah. and what you do for a living is stream your thoughts. Maybe yeah, you know, that's an any... interesting perspective. So, wow, I haven't really considered. That's very manly, man. Wow, how the cool. The red pill movement in general is just very mind-boggling to me, to be honest with you. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I it, actually For those think, watching who are old like yeah. me, explain what red-pilled men are. From my understanding, sure. and I kind of importantly distance myself from nice. this on purpose because I just don't have the emotional bandwidth uh, to keep up with it every day. It's sort of this like hyper overcorrection mm-hmm. of masculinity and the alpha male mm-hmm. movement. So you hear a couple of names thrown around like an Andrew Tate, for example, mm-hmm. and it's these people who create God, content listening. geared towards men specifically Mm -hmm. that typically involves discussing women but is usually geared towards men that's encouraging men to just reject anything associated with women whatsoever so never ever get married because it's going to hold you back is this the inverse of feminism yes it is quite literally a man needs a woman like a a fish needs a bite (laughs) okay very well said never get married because the whole institution is set up to make you fail the whole institution is set up for a woman to divorce you and to take all of your money and you're never going to be happy and you're never going to be successful You should work as many jobs as possible so that you can amass as much money as possible to buy as many sports cars as possible and fancy watches and very nice designer clothes and live in a penthouse in Dubai somewhere. And then also, you should expect a woman that you engage in a relationship with, probably very loosely, I'm using that Mm. word relationship Mm because you're not committing. She should have a body count. I hate that word. It means how many people that you've slept with, but they've yeah. they've coined this phrase oh, of they? zero. Okay. Mm. She should have a body count of zero, but you should expect to have as many numbers as you possibly can on your side of things. And yeah. I just keep thinking to myself, the math doesn't math there. Like eventually you're going to run out of women with the number zero. And then yeah. what? You guys are just going to sleep shameful. with each other. I don't understand it's logically how that works. I don't know if I use the word effeminate anymore. I would say that's quite effeminate, but I don't, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to clarify that because somebody pointed out to me that effeminate means something other different than I thought it did. It just means like what women do. And obviously, so that's wrong. Um, Thomas Aquinas uses the word effeminate. I don't know what the translation is in the, in the Latin. Hmm. Um, Let's so look it, it up. Why not? Well, all right. What do you mean? Look up what? Let's look up what the Latin roots of this are. Well, Thursday, you want to look this up? What Aqui- like When Aquinas uses the word effeminate... What does he mean? I know what the definition, so the definition, thank you, the definition here is having feminine qualities untypical of a man, not manly in appearance or manner. So the reason I don't like calling red-pilled men effeminate, though I want to because I wish to insult them, Mm -hmm. is because it makes it sound like you're acting like women who are essential, but that's not true. Um, No, I actually think it sounds silly. This will make me sound. I think immasculine, maybe. I I think unmasculine. It's It's almost what culture is trying to paint toxic masculinity to be, but they're just doing it Mm. as if like the feminist movement's understanding of masculinity actually came true. Just to put a button on that point, though, about when Aquinas uses the word effeminate, he he means softness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so take take women out of it because it can sound rather insulting. Obviously, Mm -hmm. women are strong and good and beautiful in their own right. But um, it seems to me that if a man refuses to commit to a woman and to lay down his life for her and to desire children who, who he wishes to serve and and uh, father that this is this is soft yeah it's the opposite yeah. of truly masculine like to be strong and to have ownership over your impulses or your mm. innate desires as a man as a human is to lay down your life to put aside your own desires to put aside yeah. your strength, strength innate needs strength on behalf of others i think is the masculine genius here okay yeah. Effeminate comes from, okay, so this is, again, I don't know if this is the Latin that he uses, 
but let's see if feminatus mm -hmm. from the well, I don't know what that means. Uh, out of woman, okay. I think is out what... of woman. It means made feminine, emasculated, weakened. So I mean, fair enough, right? Like if a fella is no longer strong, I suppose you could say he's effeminate in the way that a woman isn't as strong physically as a man. Yeah. But anyway, I I just say that because I uh, yeah. All right, unmasculine. I think that's the term I'm going to use from now. I like the term emasculated. Yeah, I do like too. Like porn emasculates a man. Actually, scientifically it does too. As a total yeah. side note, it literally makes it impossible for you to have actual successful sexual it, intimacy it experiences. It certainly can. Yeah. It can lead to erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation, which aren't boons within marriage, let's say. But yeah, I think it does. It robs a man of the ability to be masculine. And by masculine, I mean strength on behalf of others. Mm -hmm. And this is something men want. I mean, every movie men love I don't mean like, I don't mean find funny, no, but I mean love. that stirs the soul. <laughs> you try to think of one that isn't this. It, it seems like the protagonist is a man who sacrifices himself in some way mm -hmm. for something he loves, mm -hmm. be that a woman or a country or his family. And we see that and something is stirred within us. We know that this is something, you know. What's the what's a female what's the feminine genius? If that if the masculine oh. genius is strength on behalf of others. Um, oh, here we go. The term molite, molitize means softness. Okay. Huh. So, okay. So there you go. So that's interesting that that was translated as effeminate. effeminate. Yeah. That's but, very interesting. Yeah, I guess I can see. That's why it's always important to go to the to original be, language women, when you're reading these women things. Women tend to be softer yeah. <laughs> than men physically, at least. So it seems, uh, and, and maybe emotionally. So it seems that it, it's, it's, it's understandable, but the okay. Feminine genius. Yeah, I think it has to have to do with, you tell me, but nurturing, yeah. mothering, bringing forth. Like my wife is, I'd like you to meet her. I don't know when you leave. I'd love to meet her, yeah. Have you, do you know much about Cammy? I don't, seen her? too much. She's a lion. Mm. She's like a powerful woman, but not powerful in a sort of bull busting way, but in a sort of like, um, what would I say? Just uh, if she sees an injustice, she fights it. Mm. Um, like I'll just say this right now, like right now, my wife is, look, we have a baby in our house because the Sisters of Life contacted us because some woman wanted to have an abortion. We got in touch with her. The just love and ferocity of my wife's concern for others is beautiful. I yeah. actually love that you compared her to a lion, too. I love that imagery. We see it all the way throughout scripture, and mm. we see it with C.S. Lewis's writings. We see it everywhere in human and God-based interactions. I studied abroad in Zambia in college. I worked mm. in the medical field down there. And when we were on safari, it was fascinating seeing all of the lions in Botswana uh, hunting and providing for the larger community that they lived in. It's always the women. And the women do the fighting. The women do the mm. hunting. And they do all of this instead of the man. And you okay. might think the opposite is true. Because I'll read that in a second yeah. Thursday. Keep that up there. Uh, Sorry. You might think the opposite is true because of how we've created like the Lion King imagery and mm. all of that. But there's something ferociously strong mm. about providing for your family that it, comes yeah. from women. And that's and it, not and it goes, weak it goes, in any way. It goes ugly when it severs itself from wanting to mother mm -hmm. and to, to, to love her husband, I think. It, it becomes like ugly and sterile. And I think it's like that with men. Mm -hmm. Like when the desire to be strength on behalf of others turns inward. And so it's like, you know, if love is, I want your good for your sake. Uh, then lust is, I want my good at yep. your expense. And it just, it, it's like, ugh, that's so distorted. It's actually, it's actually ugly. Mm. So here's what Aquinas says. And this has to do with what we were just talking about with a, a, being effeminate. And again, we're going to just translate that word as softness since mm -hmm. it seems that that's what it means. The philosopher, by which he means Aristotle, says that the persevering man is opposed to the effeminate or softness. I answer that perseverance is deserving of praise because thereby a man does not forsake a good on account of long endurance of difficulties and toils and is directly opposed to this seemingly for a man to be ready to forsake a good on account of difficulties which he cannot endure. Let's just pause on that line for a moment and apply that to the idea of red-pilled men, right? For and for a man to be, and to myself, wretched as I am, for a man to be ready to mm. forsake a good. And, you know, when Aquinas talks about evil, 
he says that evil, evil is obviously the deprivation of a good, but that whenever we choose evil, we don't choose it for the for it being evil. We choose it because it seems to seems us good a good. To us, yeah. And so you think, well, there's a there's a perception in pornography. Let's just use that as an example as a good. Uh, it gives me something. I I feel a certain way, and I and I like that feeling, and so. All right, a man to be ready to forsake a good, and here we could say the perceived good of pornography Mm -hmm. and fornication, right, on account of difficulties which he cannot endure. And this is what we talked about earlier about the man who struggles against his lower passions to bring them in accord with reason so he can be a free man. This is what we understand by softness, Mm. because a thing is said to be soft if it readily yields to the touch. And that's why I've heard it said, and I repeat, that pornography is a sort of um, a cream puff. It turns a man into a cream puff, right? Mm. But, and again, by the way, I just want to point out, if you're a man who struggles with pornography... You, you're not this, alone. This yeah. Is, yeah, you're not alone. And this isn't meant to shame you or anyone or a woman who's f- falling to this. It's just to say, this is what it will make you. You will no longer be able to endure the desire for sexual intimacy without caving, and and it will train you in softness. It will mm. emasculate you. Um, yeah, said to be soft if it readily yields to the ch- touch. Now, a thing is not declared to be soft through yielding to a heavy blow. All right, so you think of a man who's raised with pornography from the age of seven and he finds himself, something shows up on the screen without his willing it. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, All right, so there's a struggle there. The, even if he falls... We're not saying you're soft in the sense that a man is soft who chooses to be weak. Uh, For walls yield to the battering ram. So I think of myself like I was eight years old when I stumbled across porn. This wasn't my fault. It took me a long time to realize that that wasn't my fault. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, a man is not said to be soft if he yields to heavy blows. Hence, Aristotle says that it is no wonder if a person is overcome by strong and overwhelming pleasures or sorrows but he is mm. to be pardoned if he struggles against them we'll, we'll leave it there i like thanks a lot for that thursday that's really good this this idea of struggling i want to point out too i have a and i'll wrap up and let you speak but there's a i have a course called strive21.com slash matt it's a 21 day detox from porn course that mm. i created and so if it's very well produced um, i did it with covenant eyes it's 100 percent free we've had over forty thousand men go through the course Uh, But if you're tired of porn turning you into a cream puff, strive21.com. And if you're a lady who is uh, struggling with pornography, I know the shame can be great there. I have friends who run a wonderful ministry called Magdala Ministries. Mm. And it's a wonderful group of women who are helping other women. Yeah. I love that. I think it's so important to realize this idea of forsaking a good within the context of the red pill movement. Their entire message to young men is that you are inherently deserving of all of the good things that this world has to offer of driving a Lamborghini or of wearing a zillion dollar watch or living in a penthouse (laughs) apartment or sleeping with as many women as humanly possible. That's your innate need because that's who you are as a human and you deserve that because you Mm -hmm. are a man and then you need to go out and find the strength to go out and get it. Really that just leaves you so empty inside like ultimately you can't take it with you quite literally so if if that's the way you're going to live your lifestyle at the end of your life what are you showing for your life what Mm. has been the meaning of your life the central crux of how you've chosen to live with other people and the memories that you've built along the way and the givingness that you gave to others you can't Mm -hmm. take anything with you so if your entire existence is boiled down to the entitlement of a sports car or a rolex or a penthouse apartment or a string of prostitutes and pornography videos that's really shockingly empty and really, really sad. Carol Wojtyla, who became Pope John Paul II, says in his book, Love and Responsibility, and it's so profound, the greater the love, the greater the responsibility that's felt. Mm-hmm. Like if I say to my wife, I love you, but I don't feel responsible for her good, I am a liar. And it seems to me that pornography says you can have your love, your pleasure without the responsibility. And uh, it's like trying to live on sugar and seawater. I mean, it might seem like a good idea in in the beginning, but it'll kill you. Mm. Very slowly, but it will over time. 
Good. All right. How did you become a Catholic? I know you were raised a Catholic, but at some point you said two and a half years ago, did you say? About, yeah, within the last couple of years. What was that kind of reversion like? Yeah. You know, I was always raised Catholic. I loved being Catholic as a child. I loved my first communion. I loved confirmation in the eighth grade. It was such Mm. a profound experience. I had really, Mm. really profound experiences uh, with reconciliation in particular, especially during my high school years. Um, I went to a Catholic high school, so there's a pretty common retreat that other people may have taken called Kairos, which was a hugely profound experience for me. Oh. I later went back and led it as a senior in high school. Uh, and by the time I got to college, I loved my faith, but I was just so constantly pulled in a zillion different directions that I wasn't as invested in it as I think I probably was in high school, constantly being surrounded by theology classes and mm-hmm. going to mass quite regularly at school. At the same time, while I was studying to become a physician and while I was engaging in this very important battle on my college campus for objective truth and for freedom of expression, there were a lot of people in the campus pair at the time who thought that was a really inappropriate way to be leading a Catholic life, that we really weren't supposed to go out into the secular world. We were supposed Mm -hmm. to stay pretty isolated with everything that we were doing. So most of the people on my campus were in eight Bible studies and they ate all of their meals at the church and they Mm -hmm. did every single retreat that the church had to offer. And I thought that was really beautiful, but I felt this very different calling to go to everybody else who is not involved in that and try to bring them over there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think there's such a need for missionaries in a new sense, in a new generational sense in America that's so beautifully needed in our society and is being fulfilled by many, many great organizations and great people. And I especially felt the need to do that online, which a lot of people think is crazy, but this is where culture is today. Our public square today in society isn't Mm. a street corner. It's certainly not going to your parish every single weekend, especially since uh, a post-COVID world where Mm. that's been incredibly wiped away. It's reaching people where they're at, and they just so happen to be on Instagram and TikTok. Um, I personally started exploring some Protestant denominations because of that, because I'd been told so many times I was a bad Catholic if I wasn't going every single day to daily mass because I had to study for a class. Or if I was engaging in political stuff on my campus, I shouldn't be engaging in anything related to politics. I should only be engaging in the stuff happening in the parish. And that really turned me off originally. Um, So I ended up exploring some Protestant denominations, but I always felt very unfulfilled, mostly in the non-dom world and the non-denominational world, because You go and it's this big rock concert and everybody's hands are up and it seems super friendly and welcoming. But every single time I left the service on Sunday morning, the message always felt like it was tailored exactly towards me. And you might think that would make you feel more fulfilled, like, oh, God really spoke to me in the message from this pastor. But I started to realize over time they were just keeping messages intentionally quite vague and trying to tie them to the biggest thing in pop culture so that every single person sitting in that audience walked away feeling like, that was directed exactly towards me. That's so incredible. How would the pastor know that? Uh, And it really just equally applied to everybody. There was also this fundamental difference, I think, in the Protestant world that I was discovering that church was about you. Like you were the main character. You showed up and there was free coffee waiting for you. You showed up and there were donuts in the lobby waiting for you. You were supposed to text the pastor with this short, cute message to make sure that they were always telling you, oh, here's a thing to pray about today or whatever. And that seems really nice at the outset. But when you realize you're singing secular music, you're singing like pop music so that it sticks more in your brain with every passing day, you're hearing these intentionally vague messages and you're essentially going to a rock concert because that's what we do in culture, the Protestant church in America today has become quite Americanized based on your assessment earlier by catering everything towards culture and not the other way around. Mm. And I felt myself longing for the roots of my own faith and how I was raised in the Catholic church, but also Mm. the history and the story of us as Christians that it's not about us. It's about God. And I love that about the mass. You show up and it's not about you. You're not picking the readings that day. You're not choosing what songs are sung by the choir. You're there to embrace the Eucharist. You are there to worship the God of all gods. You are there to be there to soak in everything that was established 2000 years ago, not for you, but because of our love for God and that Mm -hmm. reversal of who is the main character, who is this really supposed to be about? really helped me fall back in love with my faith. So did, were you growing in friendship with these other non-denominational folks? And how did they take it when you decided to go back to the Catholic Church? I was, yeah. So this carried on for several years after I graduated from college. I think COVID also played a huge role. I was living in Arizona at the time, and not a single parish was really offering the same experience in mass. And so I didn't really want to go because you couldn't touch anybody and you couldn't really get the Eucharist the same way. And you had to wear a mask the whole time. And it just felt very strange. Mm-hmm 
church mm-hmm. and not at mm-hmm. all the faith that I was raised in. So it was a lot easier to just watch YouTube videos of church mm-hmm. on your couch on Sunday morning, right? And of course, the dog is barking and you're making your coffee and you're scrolling through Instagram the whole time. So it's not really the immersive experience mm-hmm. it's supposed to be. Um, but ended up doing that a lot through COVID with some of my friends. And I actually was incredibly fortunate last September to take my first trip to the Holy Land. So I visited wow. Israel. Is it as wonderful as people say? People far, are always shocked. Far I've never more been. wonderful. Okay. Far more wonderful. I frankly, I would move there tomorrow. Like it, wow. it changed my entire perception really? of my faith. And we can get into all of yeah. that for sure. But I took my first trip there in September. I ended up going back eight weeks later to film a documentary about the city of Jerusalem. Mm. But like you say, this American version of Protestant Christianity doesn't really exist anywhere else. I've been incredibly fortunate to travel all over the world. I've been to 20 countries. Um, I'm going to New Zealand in a couple of weeks. So that's exciting. Oh, I'm going to Australia in a couple of weeks. There you go. We'll yeah, be neighbors again yeah. down there. Um, but everywhere that I visited, obviously, one of the most beautiful things about our faith is the universality of it with Catholic yeah. meaning universal. And I try to go to mass in every single other country that I can go to, because even if you don't speak German or mm-hmm. whatever language they're speaking in the country that you're in, you'll know what's happening in the service. I think that's so beautiful. So I decided I want to go to mass while we're here in Israel. This is the Holy Land. Everywhere I'm looking, there's Catholic churches where Jesus was born. There's a Catholic church where Mary was born. There's a Catholic church on the Mount of the Beatitudes. Uh, and when we were in Jerusalem, I looked up and there was a service open for everybody at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, mm-hmm. which is the pinnacle of our faith as all Christians. Uh, it's where Jesus was crucified, where he was buried in the tomb and where he was resurrected from the dead. And you walk into this church, having been to the Vatican, mm-hmm. very profound experience. I love Rome. But there's this spiritual depth of this solemnness and honestly you just feel connected in this like straight line of history for 2000 years the moment you walk through the front door of the church of the holy sepulcher there is a stone on the ground that people are kneeling down to pray over and that's the stone where jesus's body was laid to be prepared for burial you go upstairs and you can touch the rock of golgotha with your own hands and just like having this Mm. sensory experience of where this all happened echoed throughout all of the holy land of course sailing on the sea of galilee and going to nazareth and experiencing these things to touch to smell to see brought my faith to life in a way that I never expected was even possible. You read about all these things in your Bible and it's amazing and it's beautiful and you love seeing it, but it's a totally different experience to be on a boat on the Sea of Galilee and have your tour guide say, okay, I'm putting my hand out right here and I'm putting my hand out right here. 70% of the gospels happen between my hands and your brain just like explodes because it's 10 miles long. How is that even possible? You think of the Holy Land as this massive outer worldly experience, uh, but it's really all a very small area that's real. It's colorful. It's joyful. And everywhere you go, there are Catholic churches everywhere. So I was on this trip with Turning Point USA. And most of the people on the trip uh, were Protestant Christians. Many were Jews. uh, And me and a handful of others, two or three other people, were Catholic. And I kept noticing everywhere we went, there's a Catholic church, there's a Catholic church, there's a Catholic church, which I expected. But a lot of people, shocking, I know, no (laughs) Southern Baptist rock concerts Mm. happening in Israel. Uh, A lot of people were turned off by that. They were frustrated by that. And it got the gears turning. The fact that it was a Catholic church Uh, and not a non-denominational, everybody's, mm. everybody is welcome in our faith, but they don't necessarily Mm -hmm. see it that way. Uh, And it was fascinating, even in Capernaum, for example, they built a church right over Peter's house. So they have the foundation of Peter's home that's crumbling. It's very very, very old, 2000 years. And they've built this church over it that looks kind of like a spaceship because they've had to preserve the original ruins where Uh. the floor is glass and you can look through. And the whole time we were in Capernaum, I'm sobbing my eyes out. There's a beautiful statue of Peter right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee that says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Mm. This profound, tangible experience that you are touching. And most of the people on my trip rolled their eyes and they're like, okay, can we get back in the bus now? Like this means nothing to me. And that broke my heart because how could that mean nothing to you? Where Jesus called his first apostles, where Jesus invited his ministry to start, where the head of the church, the very first head of the church lived, where his mother was healed by Christ himself. That means nothing to you. That's incredibly shocking to me. By the time we got to Jerusalem, decided to go to Mass at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at 7, 6 or 7 in the morning and brought along my fiancé, who at the time had no interest in joining the Catholic Church. He was very vehemently against this idea mm. and our other Catholic friends. It was all in Latin. It was very beautiful, literally touching the empty tomb of Jesus. Mm. And to receive the Eucharist there, to sing in Latin there, to have this experience with people from all over the world uh, who did not speak the same languages, had nothing in common except for the beauty of our faith was easily the most profoundly moving mass that I've ever been to. Uh, After that, my fiance 
really started asking a lot of questions. And he said, you know, I didn't see one Protestant church with the exception of one the whole time that we were in the Holy Land. So that's getting me to ask a few different questions here. And that mass was really beautiful because it wasn't about me. I had no idea what was going on. I don't speak Latin. I don't really know the liturgy of the church. I don't really understand how this works quite yet, but I've never felt that much of a strong presence of God in my life whenever I've gone to church, except in that experience. Um, our friend who was baptized Catholic but hadn't been confirmed yet also started asking a lot of the same questions. And it prompted me to have to do a whole bunch of research because he had questions for things that I'd never been asked to defend before. Well, don't you worship Mary? And how is it not cannibalism when you eat the Eucharist? And I don't understand how the saints work and what the heck is purgatory? And so I ordered probably a thousand dollars worth of books right after we got back from Israel the first time. I'm still working my way through them. But the more questions that he's had, the more questions I've had. And I think your friend, your fiance, my fiance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's it both, really, but I'm now serving as my fiance sponsor nice. through RCIA, oh, so wonderful. I even have more questions about all of this. And on our very first day of his class, our amazing deacon teaching the course reminded us of a St. Augustine quote, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the more faith I have, the more questions I have, and the mm. more my questions are answered, the more faith I have. And it's mm. this constant cycle of the intellectual side of Christianity that I think we've become really numb to in the West, in America. There is no intellect when you walk into a non-denominational church service. It's, okay, everybody, let's talk about this trend movie in movie theaters and how it might tie back to mm. one quote of scripture and then we'll play you a rock song and then serve some free coffee and everybody leave. I'm not disagreeing with you, but I do want to push back because we have Protestants who are listening and I know that there's a lot of Protestants who are very intellectually engaged and who go to churches that certainly don't Absolutely. just do wishy-washy feeling things. In my experience, in your, in yeah, my experience sure. it was very superficial. It was yeah. very surface level. It was very emotionally yeah. driven. There wasn't a whole lot going on intellectually. Um, and I have many, many very well-educated Protestant mm -hmm. friends and love having great spiritual debates with them. But I just, I wanted something more. I yeah. wanted the fullness of our faith. I wanted all of these deep questions to be answered for myself and so that I could help other people answer those questions. And it's just been the most beautiful journey falling back in love with how I was mm -hmm. raised. When I was exploring some other denominations, my dad said, Catholicism is the religion that you were raised with. It's how we raised you very intentionally, and I hope that you'll come back to this. But more mm. so, I hope that you'll come back to this because it's our heritage as Christians. Mm. And ultimately, that's the story of who we've been for the last 2,000 years. To be connected to the earliest church, mm. to be connected to Christ himself, is to embrace our heritage that way. What were some of the most helpful books that you got oh out my of this $1,000 spending spree? Uh, why do Catholics do that? I can't. Kevin Orlin Johnson wrote that fantastic book that broke everything down into like two pages each for some of the biggest questions that then got me going. I've read a lot of uh, Trent Horn. I've read yeah. a lot of Scott Hahn over the last year or so. Brant Petra has been phenomenal mm -hmm. in understanding the Judaism side of this, which yeah. also was very eye opening in Israel. Um, most of the people on our trip who were very involved in their faith, were raised in the Protestant world, had absolutely zero understanding or knowledge of Judaism. And frankly, I didn't really either, especially ancient Judaism, which is the fulfillment that our faith brought uh, to their religion. But understanding why things are set up the way they are, why the Eucharist was established as the pinnacle of worship, mm -hmm. how Mary fits into all of this, understanding that from a Jewish perspective has been hugely eye-opening to Did myself. Did you have a particular obstacle after spending time with non-denominations? non-denominationals about the Catholic faith or not really? No, you yeah. know, and amazingly, you'd probably expect that I would. I would have grown a hardness or something to all of this, but yeah. maybe it was just the grace of God that allowed me to re-embrace a lot of things. I also think there's this trend in how young Catholics are being raised, particularly in Catholic schools right now in America. There are some great Catholic schools out there, and I attended a fantastic uh, program in Denver, Colorado, but mm. um, even taking mandatory classes in church history, I could not tell you one thing that I actually remember from that class. It was yeah. just not that meaningful or didn't sink in very much. We took a reasons for the faith class, why you should embrace this as an adult once you oh, graduate that's... your senior year. Honestly, could not tell you uh. at all what happened in that class. So they were important and I'm glad that happened. But there's almost this trend like the rebelling against society that I saw with a lot of the very beautiful Catholic families I grew up going to school with, that the kids would rebel against their parents, would rebel against their teachers and embrace atheism in a way to try to break free from the, mm -hmm. the cult of their family or whatever they wanted to say. Um, and so I, I do think there's an element that needs to be addressed in the American Catholic Church. Something is a missing link here between our heritage all over the world and how mm -hmm. the rest of our Catholic faith is doing this, and then almost too secularized version of American Catholicism. Oh, yeah. How can we bring back some of that tradition? So when did you start getting... Um, when did you start working alongside of locals? I know you do things with them and you don't work for them, but 
How did that come about? Yeah, I actually started a locals community when I decided to go more independent with all of my content. Now, why did you choose that over the many other different variations of locals? I knew about locals uh, for a long time already. I have a longstanding relationship with their founder, Dave Rubin, for example. So I kind of knew that the company existed, but had wanted to do a little bit more content that was for a tighter knit community and not just for my big YouTube channel or Mm -hmm. my Instagram or my TikTok, um, specifically more on dating and faith and diving really into the deep, deep concepts like the stuff we're talking about here today that the rest of my audience might not be as interested in. Um, And then I ended up helping the company. So I do some contract work with them, reaching other creators who have no idea idea that Rumble or Locals exists. Mm-hmm. For those that don't know, they are they share the same parent company, so they are intricately related. Um, but there's a lot of creators out there who might be on Substack or who might have a Patreon that are being silenced or, or censored in some of the things that they're saying, but they mm-hmm. have no idea that we as an alternative exist out there. So I'm posting on their Instagram and helping them reach some new people. So I'll tell you how I got on Locals. And I, how much do you know about Locals? I presume a you know. A whole lot. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask, ask you questions about it. Yeah. So for those who aren't aware, this is a kind of a, a, a crowdfunding website similar to Patreon. So I was on Patreon for the longest time. And then, of course, Patreon decided to ban a few people for bad reasons. And I got the sense that my days were numbered, just like I have the sense that my days are numbered on YouTube, depending on what I talk about. Whoops, <laughs> sorry. And so it was actually Ori who got in touch with me. And what's Ori's role in the company? She- um, you know, I don't know her exact title off the top of my head, but she does most of the creator relations and, and handling. So all she that. got in touch with me about two and a half years ago and asked me if I wanted to come over to Locals, and I said no, not at all. I mean, I appreciate the <laughs> offer, but I that would be far too confusing. I'm already on Patreon. I'm yeah, not how do you migrate start those on people? Locals? They won't migrate, and that would be weird. So I'm not going to do it. And uh, I was shocked at how. Uh, sincere she was, you know, because when people are trying to get you on their platform, it's obviously for a financial incentive. That's why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe she had some concerns that uh, I might get banned and what that might mean for me. But even if she didn't have that, I think it's fair enough to have just the financial incentive since that's her job. So, you know, you're like, okay, no, I know you're trying to sell me something. I'm not interested in doing this. And uh, but she was quite persistent and just won me over. And I realized that Locals is a super platform. It is awesome. And I recommend yeah. everyone who's watching right now, if you have a crowdfunding platform, if you're starting something or even if you're on Patreon, move over to Locals. It's so much better. Obviously, I have a ton of reasons as to why. But since you work with them, what, what, why? This isn't I mean, an advert, it's, it's by the way. It's incredible for I'm a not, million. I would like to be paid by locals for this. I'm not, but I am just curious because I don't want to see fellow Catholics getting banned. Yeah, exactly. There was a fellow called Tim Gordon uh, who was on Patreon and they banned him. And uh, I think I'm remembering this right. He went over to locals. Good for him. So I would like to see other people move over to locals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's better for a zillion reasons, faith related or non faith related. A, you never have to worry about being censored, right? So, whenever no. you're saying something that is controversial or who might not follow the terms and conditions or the community guidelines somewhere, you don't have to worry about having to say things a certain way or self censor yourself mm-hmm. uh, or be demonetized in the process. You own all of your data. So, you have complete control over your entire community. You own all the data for the people who follow you. You can email them if you want. So, there's a much more direct connection there. We call them community communities for a reason because we're building that sense of community digitally. Uh, but it also just has way more features than mm. any other crowdfunding platform. Like Substack is a written platform. You can do articles on locals. You can do podcasts on locals. You can do live streams on locals. Mm-hmm. Anything under the sun can exist there. I love the feature the most that people in the community can post in the community. So it's not a one-way feed of communication. Uh, your supporters and the members of your community can share a meme with you or say, hey, I'm really struggling with this thing. Do you have any advice? And it just builds that sense of camaraderie that you don't get on a Facebook feed or on your Instagram profile. I think it was Dave Rubin who said that locals is what social media should have been, but quickly wasn't. Yeah. And we get that sense a lot. Like it's in order to see for those who aren't aware, like you can post on this platform locals. Um, and by the way, we'll put your locals link and my locals link below. So Perfect. people can follow us there. So people can follow me there and see a lot of the things that I post, but they can't comment yeah. unless they're invested financially. Um, and that's wonderful because I don't know how many There's very few trolls who Mm -hmm. are willing to pay money to troll. Yeah, exactly. And if they are, I'm quite impressed, actually. Yeah, well, it's happened. It happened to me this morning, actually. Somebody somebody made a comment that was so out of line. Um, And since I'm not a free speech guy, I just blocked them. Yeah. And they can have their money back. You have control over your community. That's the beautiful part. Because I don't want it to become a toxic thing where people come and say all sorts of slanderous things against each other. But what I've found in the community is people try to give each other the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. So if they say something that others disagree with, there is more of a, okay, like, I don't know if I'd phrase it that way, or what do you mean by that, Mm -hmm. that you just don't get on social media. So no, I, I've you re- don't. Let me ask you about owning your own content. Here's mm. my understanding. 
Uh, I presume that if I was, if somebody was posting, say, pornography or violence, I would hope that locals would ban them. But my understanding is, even if locals were to ban me, the money keeps coming in because I'm getting paid directly through Stripe and not through locals. Yeah. So the the general rule of thumb, and again, I'm not speaking for the company, so this is just sure. my understanding of it. The general rule of thumb is unless you're actively breaking the law and they have an obligation to act out against you, you can post whatever you want in your community. And but you not have... pornography, thank God. No, I, yeah. I, that's my understanding. Yeah, of but that wouldn't be works. breaking the law, right? But that, that's a that's a thank God they have that exception. Yeah. I would have been very against them. If they, if they, I would not have Had joined that. It's not I would only encourage fans, everybody yeah. to run, yeah, from locals if they did permit that. Yeah. It's definitely not only fans. It is yeah. gen generally pretty great content. Um, but you don't all have to agree, right? I mean, there are literally hundreds of different creators on this platform who could not have the most mm -hmm. dramatically different walks of life. There are some red pill people yeah. Yeah. on locals. There are carnivore there are some, diet there people. Are there are homeschooling family yeah. people. I mean, like literally anything you can wrap your head around. I just think it's fantastic to see the infrastructure of a rumble and locals offering an alternative to this idea mm -hmm. that you have to self-censor and you can't talk about what really needs to be talked about. YouTube, for example, just updated their community guidelines oh, to say gosh. that if you misgender someone, they'll just immediately take your channel. When did they do this? And I do this all the time. Like I just say what you actually are. It. Yeah, literally. Yeah. And so apparently it's a new, like loosely regulated guideline, but I saw Candace talking Matt about it the other day. <laughs> it's never Matt been Frad more important. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, here's what's bad about that, eh? Like, what what bothers me is that when Christians begin to censor their own speech mm -hmm. so as to grow their little tribe, and maybe they tell themselves, it's so that I can do more good than I otherwise would, and admit that's, that's true, fair enough, there's definitely something to that. But the problem is, when there is now a absence of truth in the town square, which yep. is YouTube, then the only truth I'm hearing about transgenderism, to use that example, is from the left... So I'm hearing propaganda from the left and I'm not hearing it rebuked from the right or Christians, let's say, because they're afraid of having their YouTube channel taken away and they're justifying that so that they can do more good. Then it seems like you're just going to have people being gradually brainwashed into this position. I don't want to fall into that. I would yeah. rather be banned. I just had an abortionist on my show the other day, an ex-abortionist. It was a great episode. Did you watch it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was wild. I, I wrote to George Farmer. I said, I'm fairly certain I'm going to be blocked for this or, or totally demonetized, if not blocked. And that wasn't hyperbole. I, I actually thought that that would happen. It hasn't happened yet. It might happen. It is interesting because it does seem like it's... Uh, there's no rhyme or reason to it sometimes. Yeah, it's very, very random. And often you can get it back. I think most okay. people assume you'll immediately be demonetized or taken off the air or whatever. Your account will be completely banned and that's just it forever. My TikTok account, I call it the Lazarus of TikTok accounts. It's been permanently banned like 12 times oh. and we keep appealing and they didn't <laughs> actually do anything wrong, right? I didn't actually break any rules. Typically what will happen is uh, some left-wing influencer or content creator will go tell all of their followers, go mass report this account report them for bullying, report them for hate speech, whatever. And so the platform feels like, oh, something's clearly going on. I'll just take mm. it away. But when you appeal it, you didn't actually do anything wrong. And I found the same thing to be true on YouTube. I was uh, given a community guideline strike a few months ago uh, for medical misinformation because I was talking about a company in San Francisco called Conception. It's the name of this company. And they're a biotech startup company literally trying to grow babies free from any egg cells or any sperm cells in entirely from stem cells mm. in a laboratory, which is very, very eerie and creepy. Uh, all in Petri dishes, like there's no actual human procreation involved in this mm. whatsoever. And I was talking about how wildly crazy that was. It's like a Black Mirror episode or something. And they said, they didn't actually say that. And I sent them a screenshot of their website and said, yes, they did. This is what we're talking about. Okay. And almost immediately, yeah, almost immediately my channel was reinstated. Maybe you can help me. I have a channel called Catholic Lo-Fi. I love Catholic Lo-Fi, <laughs> Matt, I Thank listen to you. it all the time. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I would like to do more, but I was demonetized within a week of it big of it Seriously? starting up. So I make no money through it and I'm just pumping money Why into Why did they demonetize thing. you? Well, they said I was using duplicate content or something. Huh. I appealed it about three times because I'm not. And uh, I keep getting the robot back saying, sorry. So if you know anybody who you knows know, anybody, we'll talk up to the show and in, try to at, fix at, that because that's wrong. Google, I would because I don't think you know it, it would be easy to pretend I was a victim here and they were blocking me because I'm Catholic. I don't think that's it at all. No, it's probably the manual or the automatic review, yeah. and they haven't actually done a manual review. So which I would really be my guess. would like that because I I love it's like the opposite of the kind of 
intensity and anxiety inducing content that we sometimes put out. It would be nice to have a place where people can chill and relax yep. and cost a lot of money to create this stuff. But I'm I love sure it doing does, it because yeah. people tell me they, their babies go to sleep to it oh, and things like I that. Oh, I love that yeah, yeah. so much. Yeah, I think it's lovely. Okay, so. we're going to get that reinstated for you for sure. I would like that very sure. much, yeah. Well, it's really scary actually when you think about it because usually it is like an automatic algorithm that's reviewing your content and saying something's wrong with it. And then when an actual human being looks at it, they say, oh, that's wrong. Yeah. The more we move into this algorithm world without actual human eyes, I think that's going to start happening a whole lot more. Well, yeah, that's a good point. Now, yeah, because it's a lot cheaper to have a computer review it than a person. Person, yeah. Um, YouTube is a, such a huge behemoth of a company. What the heck is Rumble's plan? I mean, how does Rumble even survive? Do you remember Vimeo? Remember Vimeo was yeah. a thing and then it became like more of an artsy thing? Yeah, they, it's like exclusively an artsy thing. Is yeah. it even still around? I don't know if it is. I, yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, and I think you have to pay for subscriptions and that's how they get around Oh, it. interesting. And, but um, but do you know much about Rumble? You know, it certainly is an uphill battle. I know some people on the team at Rumble. I don't really know their 30,000 foot company strategy or anything. But I do think it's fascinating to see the level of success they've already amassed. Mm. Everyone said that would be impossible to become a publicly traded company, to have as many users on the platform as they do, to generate the kind of revenue that they are generating. I mean, they're paying very, very, very expensive creators to be Rumble streamers and to draw more people to the platform. Uh, and I think that's very mm. telling that people are looking for an alternative. But I don't even think they are the only alternative. It's fascinating. Uh, YouTube is more than a video platform. It's really a search engine, right? Because it's owned by Google. And that's where we go look things up. How do I learn mm. how to use Adobe Photoshop? I've spent many hours on YouTube doing that exact same thing. New data has come out that Gen Z actually is using TikTok as our number one search engine above Google, above YouTube, above anything else. Uh -huh. And that's how we're getting information. So uh -huh. it's fascinating to just see the nature of the social media world change yeah. because of more competition in the marketplace in general. Okay. Well, I hope that Rumble continues. All of my stuff for people watching that we post here posts there. I don't know how they made that agreement with YouTube. I have no idea. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not expecting you to. It's just yeah. <laughs> it is kind of bizarre to me that YouTube presumably would have to permit that. So the way it works is I don't have to re-upload. I know you know this, but for those at home, I don't have to re-upload every video to Rumble that mm -hmm. I post on YouTube. Rather, just... it gets mirrored on Rumble. And my understanding is that if YouTube were to ban me, all of those videos would remain on Rumble. But, I actually yeah. don't know. That's a great question. Is like it uploaded as a separate video to Rumble just in case you I'm were taken off of YouTube. I'm quite confident when I had a conversation huh. with the fellas there, they said that. So that's... Wild stuff. Yeah. All right. G'day, everybody. I want to let you... Nope. Start again. Who? If you become a new annual supporter over at mattfrad.locals.com, this month only, we are going to send you a free Pints with Aquinas Crystal Whiskey glass. We're very proud of them. They're very beautiful. We try to raise extra money from time to time over on Locals because we have a lot of big plans, which are going to require a lot of money, to be honest with you. And so we'd really appreciate it. We just ask that you pay for shipping, but we can ship these Crystal Whiskey glasses to anywhere in the world. Again, that's just for people who sign up, who are new supporters this month, who are annual supporters and we'll send that to you. But you should know, because uh, this is my favorite thing, and I wish I talked about this more because I think it's amazing. We have a Pints with Aquinas newspaper called The Jill. It's very beautiful, very well done. And we ship this out four times a year wherever you live in the world, and we even pay shipping for those. We have a bunch of other th uh, free things. We just, we're just we uploading right now a Lord of the Rings masterclass taught by Joseph Pierce in a studio. It's very beautiful. So I give you a ton of stuff in return when you become an annual supporter of ours over on Local. So please consider it, and a massive thank you to your help. Also, I should say this, if you are currently a Local supporter, let people know in the description what you think of Local's. Because my experience has been that people think it's terrific. It's what social media should be, but never was. It's actually social, people encouraging each other, praying for each other, supporting each other. God bless you.